Section 12 of Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2. By Herman Melville. Chapters 56 through 60. Chapter 56. A scene in Tea Land of Warwick's, or Kingmakers. Wending our way from the temple, we were accompanied by a fluent, obstreperous white, one Zenobi, a runaway native of Porfido, but now an enthusiastic inhabitant of Vivenza. Here comes our great chief, he cried. Behold him. It was I that had a hand in making him what he is. And so saying, he pointed out a personage, no way distinguished, except by the tattooing on his forehead, stars, thirty in number, and an uncommonly long spear in his hand. Freely he mingled with the crowd. "'Behold how familiar I am with him,' cried Zenobi, approaching and pitcher-wise taking him by the handle of his face. "'Friend,' said the dignitary, "'thy salute is peculiar, but welcome.' I reverence the enlightened people of this land. Mean-spirited hound, muttered Medea. Were I him, I had impaled that audacious plebeian. There's a head chief for you now, my fine fellow, cried Zenobi. Hurrah! Three cheers! Ay, ay, all kings here, all equal. Everything's in common. Here a bystander, feeling something grazing his side, looked down, and perceived Zenobi's hand in clandestine vicinity to the pouch at his girdle end. Whereupon the crowd shouted, A thief! A thief! And with a loud voice the starred chief cried, Seize him, people, and tie him to yonder tree. And they seized and tied him on the spot. Ah, said Medea, this chief has something to say after all. He pinions a king at a word though a plebeian takes him by the nose. Beshrew me, I doubt not that spear of his, though without a tassel, is longer and sharper than mine. There's not so much freedom here as these freemen think, said Babalanja, turning. I laugh and admire. Chapter 57 They Hearken Unto a Voice from the Gods Next day we retraced our voyage northward to visit that section of Vivenza. In due time we landed. To look round was refreshing. Of all the lands we had seen, none looked more promising. The groves stood tall and green. The fields spread flush and broad. The dew of the first morning seemed hardly vanished from the grass. On all sides was heard the fall of waters, the swarming of bees, and the rejoicing hum of a thriving population. Ha, ha, laughed Yumi. Labor laughs in this land, and claps his hands in the jubilee groves. Methinks that Yila will yet be found. Generously entertained, we tarried in this land, till at length, from over the lagoon, came full tidings of the eruption we had witnessed in Franco, with many details. The conflagration had spread through Porfido, and the kings were to and fro hunted, like malefactors by bloodhounds. All that part of Marty was heaving with throes. With the utmost delight, these tidings were welcomed by many, yet others heard them with boding concern. Those, too, there were who rejoiced that the kings were cast down, but mourned that the people themselves stood not firmer. A victory turned to no wise and enduring account, said they, is no victory at all. Some victories revert to the vanquished, but day by day great crowds ran down to the beach, in wait for canoes periodically bringing further intelligence. Every hour new cries startled the air. Hurrah! Another kingdom is burnt down to the earth's edge. Another demigod is unhelmed. Another republic is dawning. Shake hands, freemen, shake hands. Soon will we hear of Dominora down in the dust of hapless Verdana, free as ourselves. All Porfido's volcanoes are bursting. 
who may withstand the people? The times tell terrible tales to tyrants. Ere we die, freemen, all Mardi will be free. Overhearing these shouts, Babalanja thus addressed Medea. My lord, I cannot but believe that these men are far more excited than those with whom they so ardently sympathize. But no wonder. The single discharges which are heard in Porfiro here come condensed in one tremendous report. Every arrival is a firing off of events by platoons. Now, during this tumultuous interval, King Medea very prudently kept himself exceedingly quiet. He doffed his regalia, and in all things carried himself with a dignified discretion. And many hours he absented himself, none knowing whither he went, or what his employment. So also with Babalanja, but still pursuing our search, at last we all journeyed into a great valley, whose inhabitants were more than commonly inflated with the ardor of the times. Rambling on, we espied a clamorous crowd gathered about a conspicuous palm, against which a scroll was fixed. The people were violently agitated, storming out maledictions against the insolent knave, who, overnight, must have fixed there that scandalous document. But whoever he may have been, certain it was, he had contrived to hood himself effectually. After much vehement discussion, during which sundry inflammatory harangues were made from the stumps of trees nearby, it was proposed that the scroll should be read aloud, so that all might give ear. Seizing it, a fiery youth mounted upon the bowed shoulders of an old man, his sire, and with a shrill voice, ever and anon, interrupted by outcries, read as follows. Sovereign kings of Avenza, it is fit you should hearken to wisdom, but well aware that you give ear to little wisdom except of your own, and that as freemen you are free to hunt down him who dissents from your majesties. I deem it proper to address you anonymously. And if it please you, you may ascribe this voice to the gods, for never will you trace it to man. It is not unknown, sovereign kings, that in these boisterous days the lessons of history are almost discarded as superseded by present experiences, and that while all Marty's present has grown out of its past, it is becoming obsolete to refer to what has been. Yet, peradventure, the past is an apostle. The grand error of this age, sovereign kings, is the general supposition that the very special Diabolus is abroad whereas the very special Diabolus has been abroad ever since Marty began. And the grand error of your nation, sovereign kings, seems this, the conceit that Marty is now in the last scene of the last act of her drama, and that all preceding events were ordained to bring about the catastrophe you believe to be at hand, a universal and permanent republic. May it please you, those who hold to these things are fools, and not wise. Time is made up of various ages, and each thinks its own a novelty. But embedded in the walls of the pyramids, which outrun all chronicles, sculptured stones are found, belonging to yet older fabrics. And as in the mound-building period of yore, so every age thinks its erections will forever endure. But as your forests grow apace, sovereign kings, overrunning the tumuli in your western vales, so, while deriving their substance from the past, succeeding generations overgrow it, but in time themselves decay. Oro decrees these vicissitudes. In chronicles of old you read, sovereign kings, that an eagle from the clouds presaged royalty to the fugitive Takinu, and a king Takinu reigned. No end to my dynasty, thought he. But another omen descended, foreshadowing the fall of Zuperbi, his son. And Zuperbi, returning from his camp, found his country a fortress against him. No more kings would she have. And for five hundred twelve moons, the Regifugium, or King's Flight, was annually celebrated, like your own Jubilee Day. And rampant young orators stormed out detestation of kings and augurs swore that their birds presaged immortality to freedom. Then Romara's free eagles flew over all Mardi, 
and perched on the topmost diatoms of the east. Ever thus must it be. For mostly monarchs are as gemmed bridles upon the world, checking the plungings of a steed from the pampas. And republics are as vast reservoirs, draining down all streams to one level, and so breeding a fullness which cannot remain full without overflowing. And thus Romara flooded all Mardi, till scarce an Ararat was left of the lofty kingdoms which had been. Thus also did Franco, fifty-twelve moons ago. Thus may she do again. And though not yet have you, sovereign kings, in any large degree done likewise, it is because you overflow your redundancies within your own mighty borders, having a wild western waste which many shepherds with their flocks could not overrun in a day. Yet overrun at last it will be, and then the recoil must come. And may it please you that thus far your chronicles had narrated a very different story, had your population been pressed and packed like that of your old sire land, Dominora. Then your great experiment might have proved an explosion, like the chemists who, stirring his mixture, was blown by it into the air. For though crossed and recrossed by many brave quarterings, and boasting the great bull in your pedigree, yet, sovereign kings, you are not meditative philosophers like the people of a small republic of old, nor enduring Stoics like their neighbors. Pent up like them, may it please you, your thirteen original tribes had proved more turbulent than so many mutinous legions. Free horses need wide prairies, and fortunate for you, sovereign kings, that you have room enough wherein to be free. And may it please you, you are free, partly, because you are young. Your nation is like a fine, florid youth, full of fiery impulses, and hard to restrain, his strong hand nobly championing his heart. On all sides, freely he gives, and still seeks to acquire. The breath of his nostrils is like smoke in spring air. Every tendon is electric with generous resolves. The oppressor he defies to his beard, the high walls of old opinions he scales with a bound. In the future he sees all the domes of the east. But years elapse, and this bold boy is transformed. His eyes open not as of yore. His heart is shut up as a vice. He yields not a groat. And seeking no more acquisitions, is only bent on preserving his hoard. The maxims once trampled under foot are now printed on his front, and he who hated oppressors is become an oppressor himself. Thus often with men, thus often with nations. Then marvel not, sovereign kings, that old states are different from yours, and think not your own must forever remain liberal as now. Each age thinks its own is eternal. But though for five hundred twelve moons, all Ramara, by courtesy of history, was republican. Yet at last her terrible king-tigers came, and spotted themselves with gore. And time was, when Dominora was republican, down to her sturdy backbone. The son of an absolute monarch became the man Carolus, and his crown and head both rolled in the dust. And Dominora had her patriots by thousands, and lusty defenses and glorious areopagiticas were written, not since surpassed and no turban was doffed save in homage of Oro. Yet may it please you, to the sound of pipe and tabor, the second king Carolus returned in good time, and was hailed gracious majesty by high and low. Throughout all eternity the parts of the past are but parts of the future reversed. In the old footprints up and down you mortals go, eternally travelling your sierras and not more infallible the ponderings of the calculating machine than the deductions from the decimals of history. In nations, sovereign kings, there is a transmigration of souls, in you is a marvellous destiny. The eagle of Romara revives in your own mountain bird, and once more is plumed for her flight. Her screams are answered by the vauntful cries of a hawk, his red comb yet reeking with slaughter. And one east one west, those bold birds may fly, 
till they lock pinions in the midmost beyond. But soaring in the sky over the nations that shall gather their broods under their wings, that bloody hawk may hereafter be taken for the eagle. And though crimson republics may rise in constellations like fiery aldebarans speeding to their culminations, yet down must they sink at last, and leave the old sultan sun in the sky, in time again to be deposed. For little longer, may it please you, can republics subsist now than in days gone by. For, assuming that Marty is wiser than of old, nevertheless, though all men approach sages in intelligence, some would yet be more wise than others. And so the old degrees be preserved, and no exemption would an equality of knowledge furnish from the inbred servility of mortal to mortal. From all the organic causes which inevitably divide mankind into brigades and battalions, with captains at their head. Civilization has not ever been the brother of equality. Freedom was born among the wild eyries in the mountains, and barbarous tribes have sheltered under her wings when the enlightened people of the plain have nestled under different pinions. Though thus far for you, sovereign kings, your republic has been fruitful of blessings. Yet in themselves, monarchies are not utterly evil. For many nations, they are better than republics. For many, they will ever so remain. And better on all hands that peace should rule with a scepter than that the tribunes of the people should brandish their broadswords. Better be the subject of a king, upright and just, than a freeman in Franco, with the executioner's axe at every corner. It is not the prime end and chief blessing to be politically free and freedom is only good as a means is no end in itself nor did man fight it out against his masters to the haft not then would he uncollar his neck from the yoke a born thrall to the last yelping out his liberty he still remains a slave unto otto and well is it for the universe that otto scepter is absolute world old the saying that it is easier to govern others than oneself, and that all men should govern themselves as nations needs that all men be better and wiser than the wisest of one-man rulers. But in no stable democracy do all men govern themselves. Though an army be all volunteers, martial law must prevail. Delegate your power, you leagued mortals must. The hazard you must stand. And though unlike King Bello of Dominora, your great chieftain, sovereign kings, may not declare war of himself. Nevertheless has he done a still more imperial thing, gone to war without declaring intentions. You yourselves were precipitated upon a neighboring nation ere you knew your spears were in your hands. But as in stars, you have written it on the welkin, sovereign kings. You are a great and glorious people. And verily, yours is the best and happiest land under the sun. But not wholly, because you, in your wisdom, decreed it. Your origin and geography necessitated it. Nor in their germ are all your blessings to be ascribed to the noble sires, who of yore fought in your behalf, sovereign kings. Your nation enjoyed no little independence before your declaration declared it. Your ancient pilgrims fathered your liberty and your wild woods harbored the nursling. For the state that today is made up of slaves cannot tomorrow transmute her bond into free, though lawlessness may transform them into brutes. Freedom is the name for a thing that is not freedom. This a lesson never learned in an hour or an age. By some tribes it will never be learned. Yet if it please you, there may be such a thing as being free under Caesar. Ages ago, there were as many vital freemen as breathe vital air today. Names make not distinctions. Some despots rule without swaying scepters. Though King Bello's palace was not put together by yoked men, your federal temple of freedom, sovereign kings, was the handiwork of slaves. It is not gildings and gold maces and crown jewels alone that make a people servile. There is much bowing and cringing among you yourselves, sovereign kings. Poverty is abased before riches all Mardi over. 
Anywhere it is hard to be a debtor. Anywhere the wise will lord it over fools. Everywhere suffering is found. Thus, freedom is more social than political, and its real felicity is not to be shared. That is of a man's own individual getting and holding. It is not who rules the state, but who rules me. Better be secure under one king than exposed to violence from twenty millions of monarchs, though oneself be of the number. But superstitious notions you harbor, sovereign kings. Did you visit Dominora, you would not be marched straight into a dungeon. And though you would behold sundry sights displeasing, you would start to inhale such liberal breezes, and hear crowds boasting of their privileges, as you of yours. Nor has the wine of Dominora a monarchical flavor. Now, though far and wide, to keep equal pace with the times, great reforms of a verity be needed. Nowhere are bloody revolutions required. Though it be the most certain of remedies, no prudent invalid opens his veins to let out his disease with his life. And though all evils may be assuaged, all evils cannot be done away. For evil is the chronic malady of the universe, and checked in one place, breaks forth in another. Of late, on this head, some wild dreams have departed. There are many who erewhile believed that the age of pikes and javelins was past, that after a heady and blustering youth, old Marty was at last settling down into a serene old age, and that the Indian summer, first discovered in your land, sovereign kings, was the hazy vapor emitted from its tranquil pipe. But it has not so proved. Marty's pieces are but truces. Long absent at last the red comets have returned, and return they must, though their periods be ages. And should Marty endure till mountain melt into mountain, and all the isles form one table-land, yet would it but expand the old battle-plain. Students of history are horror-struck at the massacres of old, but in the shambles men are being murdered today. Could time be reversed, and the future change places with the past, the past would cry out against us, and our future full as loudly as we against the ages foregone. All the ages are his children, calling each other names. Hark ye, sovereign kings, cheer not on the yelping pack too furiously. Hunters have been torn by their hounds. Be advised, wash your hands, hold aloof. Oro has poured out an ocean for an everlasting barrier between you and the worst folly which other republics have perpetrated. That barrier holds sacred, and swear never to cross over to Porfido by manifesto or army unless you traverse dry land. And be not too grasping nearer home. It is not freedom to filch. Expand not your area too widely now. Seek you proselytes? Neighboring nations may be free without coming under your banner. And if you cannot lay your ambition, know this, that it is best served by waiting events. Time but time only may enable you to cross the equator and give you the arctic circles for your boundaries. So read the anonymous scroll, which straightway was torn into shreds. Old Tory and monarchist, they shouted, preaching over his benighted sermons in these enlightened times, Fool, does he not know that all the past and its graves are being dug over? They were furious, so wildly rolling their eyes after victims, that well was it for King Medea he wore not his crown, and in silence we moved unnoted from out the crowd. My lord, I am amazed at the indiscretion of a demigod, said Babalanja, as we passed on our way. I recognized your sultanic style the very first sentence. This, then, is the result of your hours of seclusion. Philosopher, I am astounded at your effrontery. I detected your philosophy the very first maxim. Who posted that parchment for you? So, each charged the other with its authorship, and there was no finding out whether, indeed, either knew aught of its origin. Now, could it have been Babalanja? Hardly. For philosophic as the document was, 
it seemed too dogmatic and conservative for him. King Medea, but though imperially absolute in his political sentiments, Medea delivered not himself so boldly when actually beholding the eruption in Franco. Indeed, the settlement of this question must be left to the commentators on Mardi some four or five hundred centuries hence. Chapter 53 They Visit the Extreme South of Vivenza We penetrated further and further into the valleys around, but though as elsewhere, at times we heard whisperings that promised an end to our wanderings. We still wandered on, and once again even Yumi abated his sanguine hopes. And now we prepared to embark for the extreme south of the land. But we were warned by the people that in that portion of Vivenza, whither we were going, much would be seen repulsive to strangers. Such things, however indulgent, visitors overlooked. For themselves, they were well aware of those evils. Northern Vivenza had done all it could to assuage them, but in vain. The inhabitants of those southern valleys were a fiery and intractable race, heeding neither expostulations nor entreaties. They were wedded to their ways. Nay, they swore that if the northern tribes persisted in intermeddlings, they would dissolve the common alliance and establish a distinct confederacy among themselves. Our coasting voyage at an end, our keels grated the beach among many prostrate palms, decaying and washed by the billows. Though part and parcel of the shore we had left, this region seemed another land. Fewer thriving things were seen. Fewer cheerful sounds were heard. Here labor has lost his laugh, cried Yumi. It was a great plain where we landed, and there, under a burning sun, hundreds of collared men were toiling in trenches filled with the taro plant, a root most flourishing in that soil. Standing grimly over these were men unlike them, armed with long thongs, which descended upon the toilers and made wounds. Blood and sweat mixed, and in great drops fell. Who eat these plants thus nourished? cried Yumi. Are these men? asked Babalanja. Which mean you? said Mohi. Heeding him not, Babalanja advanced toward the foremost of those with the thongs, one Nuli, a cadaverous, ghost-like man, with a low ridge of forehead, hair steel-gray, and wondrous eyes. Bright, nimble as the twin corpuscent balls, playing about the ends of ship's royal yards and gales. The sun passed under a cloud, and newly, darting at Babalanja those wondrous eyes, there fell upon him a baleful glare. "'Have they souls?' he asked, pointing to the serfs. "'No,' said newly. "'Their ancestors may have had, but their souls have been bred out of their descendants, as the instinct of scent is killed in pointers.' Approaching one of the serfs, Medea took him by the hand, and felt of it long, and looked into his eyes, and placed his ear to his side, and exclaimed, Surely this being has flesh that is warm. He has oro in his eye, and a heart in him that beats. I swear he is a man. Is this our lord the king? cried Mohi, starting. What art thou? said Babalanja to the serf. Dost ever feel in thee a sense of right and wrong? Art ever glad or sad? They tell us thou art not a man. Speak then for thyself. Say whether thou beliest thy maker. Speak not of my maker to me. Under the lash I believe my masters, and account myself a brute. But in my dreams bethink myself an angel. But I am bond, and my little ones... Their mother's milk is gall. Just oro, cried Yumi, do no thunders roll. No lightnings flash in this accursed land. Asylum for all Marty's thralls, cried Medea. Incendiaries, cried he with the wondrous eyes. Come ye firebrands to light the flame of revolt? Know ye not that here are many serfs who, incited to obtain their liberty, might wreak some dreadful vengeance? Avaunt, thou king! 
Thou horrified at this? Go back to Odo, and right her wrongs. These serfs are happier than thine. Though thine, no collars wear. More happy as they are than if free. Are they not fed, clothed, and cared for? Thy serfs pine for food. Never yet did these, who have no thoughts, no cares. Thoughts and cares are life, and liberty, and immortality, cried Babalanja. And are their souls then blown out as candles? Ranter, they are content, cried Nuli. They shed no tears. Frost never weeps, said Babalanja, and tears are frozen in these frigid eyes. O oh, fettered sons of fettered mothers, conceived and born in manacles, cried Yumi, dragging them through life and falling with them, clanking in the grave. O oh, beings as ourselves, how my stiff arm shivers to avenge you! T'were absolution for the matricide, to strike one rivet from your chains. My heart outswells its home. Oro, art thou? cried Babalanja. And doth this thing exist? It shakes my little faith. Then, turning upon Nuli, How can ye abide to sway this cursed dominion? Peace, fanatic, Who else may till unwholesome fields but these? And as these beings are, so shall they remain. Tis right and righteous. Marama champions it. I swear it. The first blow struck for them dissolves the union of Vivenza's veils. The northern tribes well know it, and know me. Said Medea, Yet if... No more, another word, and, king as thou art, thou shalt be dungeoned. Here... There is such a law. Thou art not among the northern tribes. And this is freedom, murmured Medea, when heaven's own voice is throttled. And were these serfs to rise and fight for it, like dogs they would be hunted down by her pretended sons. Pray heaven, cried Yumi, they may yet find a way to lose their bonds without one drop of blood. But hear me, Oro. Were there no other way, and should their masters not relent, all honest hearts must cheer this tribe of Hamo on, though they cut their chains with blades thrice-edged and gory to the haft. Tis right to fight for freedom, whoever be the thrall. These south savannas may yet prove battlefields, said Mohi gloomily, as we retraced our steps. Be it, said Yumi, Oro will van the right. Not always has it proved so, said Babalanja. Oft times the right fights single-handed against the world, and Oro champions none. In all things, man's own battles, man himself, must fight. Yumi, so far as feeling goes, your sympathies are not more hot than mine. But for these serfs you would cross spears. Yet I would not. Better present woes for some than future woes for all. No need to fight, cried Yumi. To liberate that tribe of Hamo instantly, a way may be found, and no irretrievable evil ensue. Point it out, and be blessed, Yumi. That is for Vivenza. But the head is dull where the heart is cold. My lord, said Babalanja, you have startled us by your kingly sympathy for suffering. Say thou, then, in what wise manner it shall be relieved. That is for Vivenza, said Medea. Mohi, you are old. Speak thou. Let Vivenza speak, said Mohi. Thus, then, we all agree, and weeping all but echo hard-hearted Nuli. Tears are not swords, and wrongs seem almost natural as rights. For the righteous to suppress an evil is sometimes harder than for others to uphold it. Humanity cries out against this vast enormity. Not one man knows a prudent remedy. Blame not, then, the North, and wisely judge the South. Ere, as a nation, they became responsible, this thing was planted in their midst. Such roots strike deep. Place today those serfs in Dominora, and with them all Vivenza's past, and serfs for many years in Dominora they would be. Easy is it to stand afar and rail. 
All men are censors who have lungs. We can say the stars are wrongly marshaled. Blind men say the sun is blind. A thousand muscles wag our tongues, though our tongues were housed, that they might have a home. Whose is free from crime, let him cross himself, but hold his cross upon his lips. That he is not bad is not of him. Potter's clay and wax are all molded by hands invisible. The soil decides the man, and ere birth, man wills not to be born here or there. These southern tribes have grown up with this thing. Bond women were their nurses, and bond men served them still. Nor are all their serfs such wretches as those we saw. Some seem happy, yet not as men. Unmanned, they know not what they are, and though of all the South, Newley must stand almost alone in his insensate creed. Yet, to all wrongdoers, custom backs the sense of wrong, and if to every Mardian conscience be the awarder of its own doom, then of these tribes many shall be found exempted from the least penalty of this sin. But sin it is, no less, a blot, foul as the crater pool of hell. It puts out the sun at noon. It parches all fertility. And conscience, or no conscience, ere he die, let every master who wrenches bond babe from mother, let the nipple tear, unwreathes the arms of sisters, or cuts the holy unity in twain, till apart fall man and wife like one bleeding body cleft. Let that master thrice shrive his soul. Take every sacrament, on his bended knees give up the ghost yet shall he die despairing and live again to die forever damned the future is all hieroglyphics who may read but methinks the great laggard time must now march up apace and somehow befriend these thralls it cannot be that misery is perpetually entailed though in a land prescribing primogeniture the first-born and last of Hamo's tribe must still succeed to all their sire's wrongs. Yes, time, all healing time. Time, great philanthropist, time must befriend these thralls. Oro, grant it, cried Yumi, and let Marty say Amen. Amen, 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 cried Echoes, echoing Echoes. We traversed many of these southern vales, but as in Dominora, so throughout Vivenza, north and south. Yila harbored not. Chapter 59 They converse of the Mollusca, kings, toadstools, and other matters. Once more embarking, we gained Vivenza's southwestern side and there beheld vast swarms of laborers discharging from canoes great loads of earth, which they tossed upon the beach. "'It is true, then,' said Medea, "'that these freemen are engaged in digging down other lands and adding them to their own piecemeal, and this they call extending their dominions agriculturally and peaceably. "'My lord, they pay a price for every canoe-load,' said Mohi. "'Aye,' old man holding the spear in one hand and striking the bargain with the other. Yet charge it not upon all Vivenza, said Babalanja. Some of their tribes are hostile to these things, and when their countrymen fight for land, are only warlike in opposing war. And therein, Babalanja, is involved one of those anomalies in the condition of Vivenza, said Medea, which I can hardly comprehend. How comes it that, with so many things to divide them, the valley tribes still keep their mystic league intact. All plain, it is because the model, whence they derive their union, is one of nature's planning. My lord, have you ever observed the mysterious federation subsisting among the mollusks of the Tunicata order? In other words, a species of cuttlefish, abounding at the bottom of the lagoon. Yes, in clear weather about the reefs, I have beheld them time and again, but never with an eye to their political condition. Ah, my lord king, we should not cut off the nervous communication between our eyes and our cerebellums. What were you about to say concerning the Tunicata order of Mollusca, sir philosopher? 
my very honorable lord, I hurry to conclude. They live in a compound structure, but though connected by membranous canals, freely communicating throughout the league, each member has a heart and stomach of its own, provides and digests its own dinners, and grins and bears its own gripes, without imparting the same to its neighbors. But if a prowling shark touches one member, it ruffles all. Precisely thus now with Vivenza. In that confederacy, there are as many consciences as tribes. Hence, if one member on its own behalf assumes aught afterwards repudiated, the sin rests on itself alone, is not participated. A very subtle explanation, Babalanja. You must allude, then, to those recreant tribes, which, while in their own eyes presenting a sublime moral spectacle to Marty, in King Bellows, do but present a hopeless example of bad debts, and these the tribes that boast of boundless wealth. Most true, my lord, but Bello errs, when for this thing he stigmatizes all Vivenza as a unity. Babalanja, you yourself are made up of members. Then, if you be sick of a lumbago, tis not you that are unwell, but your spine. As you will, my lord, I have said. But to speak no more on that head. What sort of a sensation, think you, life is to such creatures as those mollusca? Answer your own question, Babalanja. I will, but first tell me what sort of a sensation life is to you yourself, my lord. Pray answer that along with the other, Azagedi. Directly, but tell me, if you will, my lord, what sort of a sensation life is to a toadstool. Pray, Babalanja, put all three questions together, and then do what you have often done before, pronounce yourself a lunatic. My lord, I beseech you, remind me not of that fact so often. It is true, but annoying. Nor will any wise man call another a fool. Do you take me for a mere man, then, Babalanja, that you talk to me thus? My demi-divine lord and master, I was deeply concerned at your indisposition last night. May a loving subject inquire whether his prince is completely recovered from the effect of those guavas? Have a care, Azagedi. You are far too courteous to be civil. But proceed. I obey. In kings, mollusca, and toadstools, life is one thing and the same. The philosopher Dumdi pronounces it a certain febrile vibration of organic parts, operating upon the vis inertia of unorganized matter. But Bardiana says nay. Hear him. Who put together this marvelous mechanism of mine, and wound it up to go for three score years and ten, when it runs out and strikes time's hours no more? And what is it that daily and hourly renews, and by a miracle, creates in me my flesh and my blood? What keeps up the perpetual telegraphic communication between my outpost toes and digits, and that doomed grandee up aloft, my brain? It is not I nor you, nor he, nor it. No. When I place my hand to that king muscle my heart, I am appalled. I feel the great God himself at work in me. Oro is life. And what is death? demanded Medea. Death, my lord. It is the deadest of all things. Chapter 60 wherein that gallant gentleman and demigod, King Medea, scepter in hand, throws himself into the breach. Sailing south from Vivenza, not far from its coast, we passed a cluster of islets, green as new-fledged grass. And like the mouths of floating cornucopias, their margins brimmed over upon the brine with flowers. On some grew stately roses, on others stood twin pillars. Across others, tri-hued rainbows rested. Cried Babalanja, pointing to the last, Franco's pledge of peace, with that, she loudly vaunts she'll span the reef. Strike out all hues but red, and the tokens nearer truth. All these isles were prolific gardens, where King Bello and the princes of Porfido grew their most delicious fruits, 
nectarines, and grapes. But, though hard by, Vivenza owned no garden here, yet longed and lusted, and her hottest tribes oft roundly swore to root up all roses the half-reef over, pull down all pillars, and dissolve all rainbows. Marty's half is ours, said they. Stand back, invaders. Full of vanity and mirroring themselves in the future, they deemed all reflected there their own. Twas now high noon. Methinks the sun grows hot, said Medea, retreating deeper under the canopy. Ho, Vivi, have you no cooling beverage? None of that golden wine distilled from torrid grapes and then sent northward to be cellared in an iceberg? That wine was placed among our stores. Search, search the crypt, little Vivi. Ha, I see it. That yellow gourd. Come, drag it forth, my boy. Let's have the amber cups. So pass them round. Fill all. Taji, my demigod, up heart. Old Mohi, my babe, may you live ten thousand centuries. Ah, this way you mortals have of dying out at threescore years and ten is but a craven habit. So, Babalanja, may you never die. Yumi, my sweet poet, may you live to sing to me in paradise. Ha, <laughs> ha, would that be floated in this glorious stuff instead of this pestilent brine. Hark ye. Were I to make a Marty now, I'd have every continent a huge haunch of venison, every ocean a wine vat. I'd stock every cavern with choice old spirits and make three surplus suns to ripen the grapes all the year round. Let's drink to that. Brimmers! So, may the next Marty that's made be one entire grape, and mine the squeezing. Look, look, my lord, cried Yumi. What a glorious shore we pass. Sallying out into the high golden noon, with golden beaming goblets suspended, we gazed. This must be Columbo of the south, said Mohi. It was a long, hazy reach of land, piled up in terraces, traced here and there with rushing streams that worked up gold dust alluvian, and seemed to flash over pebbled diamonds. Heliotropes, Sunflowers, marigolds gemmed, or starred the violet meads, and basil-like still sunward bowed their heads. The rocks were pierced with grottoes, blazing with crystals, many-tinted. It was a land of mints and mines, its east a ruby, west a topaz. Inland, the woodlands stretched an ocean, bottomless with foliage its green surges bursting through cabled vines, like Xerxes' brittle chains which vainly sought to bind the Hellespont. Hence flowed a tide of forest sounds, of parrots, parakeets, macaws, blent with the howl of jaguars, hissing of anacondas, chattering of apes, and herons screaming. Out from those depths up rose a stream. The land lay basking in the world's round torrid brisket, hot with solar fire. No need here to land, cried Yumi. Yila lurks not here. Heat breeds life and sloth and rage, said Babalanja. Here live bastard tribes and mongrel nations, wrangling and murdering to prove their freedom. Refill, my lord. Methinks, Babalanja, you savor of the mysterious parchment in Vivenza, read, Ha? Huh? Yes, philosopher, these are the men who toppled castles to make way for hovels. These they who fought for freedom but find it despotism to rule themselves. These, Babalanja, are of the race to whom a tyrant would prove a blessing. So saying, he drained his cup. My lord, that last sentiment decides the authorship of the scroll. But, with deference, tyrants seldom can prove blessings inasmuch as evil seldom eventuates in good. Yet will these people soon have a tyrant over them, if long they cleave to war? Of many javelins, one must prove a scepter. Of many helmets, one a crown. It is but in the wearing. Refill, my lord. Fools! Fools! cried Medea. These tribes hate us kings, yet know not that peace is war against all kings. 
we seldom are undone by spears, which are a minister's. This wine is strong. Ha! Now's the time. In his cups learn kingcraft from a king. Aye, aye, my lord, your royal order will endure, so long as men will fight. Break the spears and free the nations. Kings reap the harvest that wave on battlefields. And oft you kings do snatch the aloe flower, whose slow blossoming mankind watches for a hundred years. Say on, my lord. All this I know, and therefore rest content. My children's children will be kings, though haply called by other titles. Marty grows fastidious in names. We royalties will humor it. The steers would burst their yokes, but have not hands. The whole herd rears and plunges, but soon will bow again, the old, old way. Yet in Porfiro, strong scepters have been wrested from anointed hands. Mankind seems in arms. Let them arm on. They hate us. Good. They always have. Yet still we've reigned, son after sire. Sometimes they slay us, Babalanja, pour out our marrow, as I this wine. But they spill no kinless blood. Twas justly held of old that but to touch a monarch was to strike at Oro. Truth. The palest vengeance is a royal ghost, and regicides but father slaves. Thrones, not scepters, have been broken. Mohi, what of the past? Has it not ever proved so? Pardon, my lord, the times seem changed. Tis held that demigods no more rule by right divine. In Vivenza's land, they swear the last kings now reign in Marty. Is the last day at hand, old man? Mohi, your beard is gray. But Yumi, listen. When you die, look around. Mark, then, if any mighty change be seen. Old kingdoms may be on the wane, but new dynasties advance. Though revolutions rise to high spring tide, monarchs will still drown hard. Monarchs survive the flood. Are all our dreams then vain, sighed Yumi? Is this no dawn of day that streaks the crimson east? Naught but the false and flickering lights which sometimes mock aurora in the north. Ah, man, my brother, have all martyrs for thee bled in vain? In vain we poets sang and prophets spoken? Nay, nay. Great Marty, helmed and mailed, strikes at oppression's shield and challenges to battle. Oro will defend the right, and royal crests must roll. Thus, Yumi, ages since, you mortal poets sang, but the world may not be moved from out the orbit in which first it rolled. On the map that charts the spheres, Marty has marked the world of kings. Round centuries on centuries have wheeled by. Has all this been its nonage? Now, when the rocks grow gray, does man first sprout his beard? Or is your golden time, your equinoctial year at hand, that your race fast presses toward perfection, and every hand grasps at a scepter, that kings may be no more? But free Vivenza, is she not the star that must ere long lead up the constellations, though now unrisen? No kings are in Vivenza, yet, spite her thralls, in that land seems more of good than elsewhere. Our hopes are not wild dreams. Vivenza cheers our hearts. She is a rainbow to the isles. Aye, truth it is that in Vivenza they have prospered. But thence it comes not that all men may be as they. Are all men of one heart and brain, one bone and sinew? Are all nations sprung of Dominora's loins? Or has Vivenza yet proved her creed? Yumi, the years that prove a man prove not a nation. But two kings' reigns have passed since Vivenza was a monarch's. Her climacteric is not come. Hers is not yet a nation's manhood, even. Though now in childhood, she anticipates her youth, and lusts for empire like any czar. You may judge not yet. Time hath tales to tell. Many books and many long, long chapters are wanting to Vivenza's history. 
and what history but is full of blood? There, stop, my lord, said Babalanja, nor aught predict. Fate laughs at prophets, and of all birds the raven is a liar. End of section 12. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 13 of Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2. By Herman Melville. Chapters 61 through 65. Chapter 61. They round the stormy Cape of Capes. Long leagues, for weary days, we voyaged along that coast, till we came to regions where we multiplied our mantles. The sky grew overcast. Each a night, black storm clouds swept the wintry sea. And like Sahara caravans, which leave their sandy wakes, so thick and fleet, slanted the scud behind. Through all this rack and mist, Ten thousand foam flake dromedary humps uprose. Deep among those panting, moaning fugitives, the three canoes raced on. And now the air grew nipping cold. The clouds shut off their fleeces, a snow hillock each canoe, our beards white frosted. And so, as seated in our shrouds, we sailed in among great mountain passes of icicles from icy ledges scaring shivering seals and white bears musical with icicles jingling from their shaggy ermine far and near in towering ridges stretched the glassy andes with their own frost shuddering through all their domes and pinnacles ice splinters rattled down the cliffs and seethed into the sea broad away in amphitheaters undermined by currents whole cities of ice-towers in crashes toward one center fell. In their earthquakes, Lisbon and Lima never saw the like. Churned and broken in the boiling tide, they swept off amain, over and over rolling, like porpoises to vessels tranced in calms, bringing down the gale. At last, rounding an antlered headland that seemed a moose at bay, ere long we launched upon blue lake-like waters, serene as Windermere or Horicon. Thus, from the boisterous storms of youth, we glide upon senility. But as we northward voyaged, another aspect wore the sea. In far-off endless vistas, colonnades of waterspouts were seen, all heaven's dome upholding on their shafts, and bright forms gliding up and down within. So, at loose, in his strange vision, Jacob saw the angels. A boundless cave of stalactites, it seemed, the cloud-borne vapors downward spiraling, till they met the whirlpool column from the sea. Then, uniting over the waters, stalked like ghosts of gods. Or, midway sundered down, sullen sunk the watery half, and far up into heaven was drawn the vapory. As at death, we mortals part in twain, our earthy half still here abiding, but our spirits flying whence they came. In good time we gained the thither side of great Colombo of the south, and sailing on long waited for the day, and wandered at the darkness. What steadfast clouds, cried Yumi, yonder far aloft, that ridge with many points, it fades below, but shows a faint white crest. Not clouds, but mountains, said Babalanja. The vast spine that traverses Columbo, spurring off in ribs that nestle loamy valleys, veined with silver streams and silver oars. It was a long embattled line of pinnacles, and high posted in the east, those thousand bucklered peaks stood forth and breasted back the dawn. Before their purple bastions bold, Aurora long arrayed her spears and clashed her golden shells. The summons dies away. But now her lancers charge the steep 
and gain its crest aglow, their glittering spears and blazoned shields triumphant in the morn. But ere that sight, we glided on for hours in twilight, when on those mountains farther side, the hunters must have been abroad, morning glories all astir. Chapter 62 They Encounter Gold Hunters now, northward coasting along Columbo's western shore, whence came the same wild forest sounds as from the eastern. And where we landed not, to seek among those wrangling tribes, after many, many days we spied prow after prow before the wind all northward bound, sails widespread and paddles plying, scaring the fish from before them. Their inmates answered not our earnest hail. But as they sped, with frantic glee, in one long chorus thus they sang. We rovers bold, to the land of gold, over bowling billows are gliding, eager to toil for the golden spoil, and every hardship biding. See, see, before our prows resistless dashes the gold fish fly in golden flashes. Neath a sun of gold we rovers bold, on the golden land are gaining. And every night we steer aright, by golden stars unwaning. All fires burn a golden glare. No locks so bright as golden hair. All orange groves have golden gushings. All mornings dawn with golden flushings. In a shower of gold, say fables old, a maiden was won by the god of gold. In golden goblets wine is beaming. On golden couches kings are dreaming. The golden rule dries many tears. The golden number rules the spheres. Gold, gold it is that sways the nations. Gold, gold, the center of all rotations. On golden axles worlds are turning. With phosphorescence seas are burning. All fireflies flame with golden gleamings, Gold hunters' hearts with golden dreamings. With golden arrows kings are slain, With gold we'll buy a freeman's name. In toilsome trades, for scanty earnings, At home we've slaved with stifled yearnings. No light, no hope, O oh, heavy woe! When nights fled fast and days drag slow, but joyful now, with eager eye, fast to the promised land we fly, where in deep mines the treasure shines, or down in beds of golden streams the gold flakes glance in golden gleams. How we long to sift that yellow drift! Rivers, rivers, cease your going, sandbars, rise and stay the tide, till we've gained the golden flowing, and in the golden haven ride. Quick, quick, my lord, cried Yumi, let us follow them, and from the golden waters where she lies, our Yila may emerge. No, no, said Babalanja, no Yila there. From yonder promised land, fewer seekers will return than go. Under a gilded guise, happiness is still their instinctive aim. But vain, Yumi, to snatch at happiness. Of that we may not pluck and eat. It is the fruit of our own toilsome planting. Slow it grows, nourished by many teats, and all our earnest tendings. Yet ere it ripen, frosts may nip, and then we plant again, and yet again. Deep, Yumi, deep, true treasure lies, deeper than all Marty's gold, rooted to Marty's axis. But unlike gold, it lurks in every soil, all Marty over. With golden pills and potions is sickness warded off, the shrunken veins of age dilated with new wine of youth. Will gold the heartache cure, turn toward us hearts estranged? Will gold on solid centers empires fix? Tis toil world wasted to toil in mines. Were all the isle's gold globes set in a quicksilver sea, all Marty were then a desert. Gold is the only poverty, of all glittering ills the direst. And that man might not impoverish himself thereby, Oro hath hidden it with all other banes. 
saltpeter, and explosives deep in mountain bowels and river beds. But man still will mine for it, and mining dig his doom. Yumi, Yumi, she we seek lurks not in the golden hills. Lo, a vision, cried Yumi, his hands wildly passed across his eyes. A vast and silent bay, belted by silent villages, gaunt dogs howling over grassy thresholds at stark corpses of old age and infancy, gray hairs mingling with sweet flaxen curls, fields with turned furrows choked with briars, arbor floors strewn over with hatchet helves, rotting in the iron, a thousand paths marked with footprints all inland leading, none villageward, and strewn with traces as of a flying host, on, over forest hill and dale, and lo, the golden region, after the glittering spoil by strange river margins, and beneath impending cliffs, thousands delve in quicksands, and, sudden, sink in graves of their own making, with gold dust mingling their own ashes. Still deeper, in more solid ground, other thousands slave, and pile their earth so high, they gasp for air, and die their comrades mounting on them and delving still and dying grave pile on grave here one haggard hunter murders another in his pit and murdering himself is murdered by a third shrieks and groans cries and curses it seems a golden hell with many camels a sleek stranger comes pauses before the shining heaps and shows his treasures yams and breadfruit Give, give, the famished hunters cry, a thousand shekels for a yam, a prince's ransom for a meal. O oh, stranger, on our knees we worship thee. Take, take our gold, but let us live. Yams are thrown them, and they fight. Then he who toiled not, dug not, slaved not, straight loads his caravans with gold regains the beach, and swift embarks for home. Home, home, the hunters cry with bursting eyes. With this bright gold could we but join our waiting wives, who wring their hands on distant shores, all then were well. But we cannot fly, our prows lie rotting on the beach. Ah, home, thou only happiness! Better thy silver earnings than all these golden findings. Oh, bitter end to all our hopes. We die in golden graves. Chapter 63 They Seek Through the Isles of Palms and Pass the Isles of Myrrh. Now our prows we turn due west across the blue lagoon. Soon no land appeared. Far as the eye could sweep, one azure plain all overflaked with foamy fleeces, a boundless flock upon a boundless mead. Again all changed, like stars in multitude, bright islets multiplied around, emerald green they dotted shapes fantastic, circles, arcs, and crescents, atolls all, or curl carcanets, begemmed and flashing in the sun. By these we glided group after group, and through the foliage spied sweet forms of maidens, like eaves in Edens ere the fall, or proserpines in Ennas. Artless airs came from the shore, and from the censer swinging roses, a bloom, as if from Heba's cheek. Here at last we find sweet Yila, murmured Yumi. Here must she lurk in innocence. Quick, let us land and search. If here, said Babalanja, Yila will not stay our coming, but fly before us through the groves. Wherever a canoe is beached, see you not the palm-tree pine? Not so, where never keel yet smote the strand. In mercy, let us fly from hence. I know not why, but our breath here must prove a blight. These regions passed, we came to savage islands where the glittering coral seemed bones embedded bleaching in the sun. Savage men stood naked on the strand and brandished uncouth clubs and gnashed their teeth like boars. 
the full red moon was rising and in long review there passed before it phantom shapes of victims led bound to altars through the groves death rattles filled the air but a cloud descended and all was gloom again blank water spread before us and after many days there came a gentle breeze fraught with all spicy breathings cinnamon aromas and in the rose-flushed evening air like glow-worms glowed the islets where this incense burned sweet isles of myrrh o crimson groves cried yumi woe woe's your fate your brightness and your bloom like musky fireflies double lure to death on ye the nations prey like bears that gorge themselves with honey swan-like our prows sailed in among these isles and oft we landed but in vain and leaving them we still pursued the setting sun chapter sixty four concentric inward with marty's reef they leave their wake around the world west 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 whitherward point hope and prophet fingers whitherward at sunset kneel all worshippers of fire Whitherward in mid-ocean the great whales turn to die. Whitherward face all the Muslim dead in Persia. Whitherward lie heaven and hell. West, west. Whitherward mankind and empires, flocks, caravans, armies, navies, worlds, suns, and stars all wind. West, west, O oh boundless boundary eternal goal whitherward rush in thousand worlds ten thousand thousand keels beacon by which the universe is steered like the north star attracting all needles unattainable forever but forever leading to great things this side thyself hive of all sunsets gabriel's pinions may not overtake thee over balmy waves still westward sailing from dawn till eve the bright, bright days sped on, chased by the gloomy nights, and in glory dying lent their luster to the starry skies. So long the radiant dolphins fly before the sable sharks but seized, and torn in flames die burning, their last splendor left in sparkling scales that float along the sea. Cymbals, drums, and psalteries, the air beats like a pulse with music high land high land and moving lights and painted lanterns what grand shore is this reverence we render thee old orienda cried medea with bared brow original of all empires and emperors a crowned king salutes thee marty's fatherland cried mohi grandsire of the nations hail all hail cried yumi kings and sages hither coming should come like palmers scrip and staff o orienda thou wert our east where first dawns song and science with marty's primal mornings but now how changed the dawn of light become a darkness which we kindle with the gleam of spears on the world's ancestral hearth we spill our brother's blood Herein, said Babalanja, have many distant tribes proved parasitical. In times gone by, Luciana hither sent her prom, Franco her scores of captains, and the dykemen their peddler hosts, with yardstick spears. But thou, O Bello, lord of the empire lineage, Noah of the moderns, sire of the long line of nations yet in germ, thou, Bello, and thy locust armies, are the present curse of orienda down ancient streams from holy plains in rafts thy murdered float the pestilence that thins thy armies here is bred of corpses made by thee marama's priests thy pious heralds loud proclaim that of all pagans orienda's most resist the truth ay vain all pious voices that speak from clouds of war the march of conquest through wild provinces may be the march of mind, but not the march of love. Thou, Bello, 
cried Yumi. Wouldst wrest the crook from Alma's hand, and place in it a spear. But vain to make a conqueror of him, who put off the purple when he came to Marty, and declining gilded mitres entered the nations meekly on an ass. O oh, curse of commerce, cried Babalanja, that it barters souls for gold. Bello, with opium thou wouldst drug this land, and murder it in sleep. And what boot thy conquests here? Seed sown by spears but seldom springs, and harvests reaped thereby are poisoned by the sickle's edge. Yet on and on we coasted, counting not the days. O oh, folds and flocks of nations, dusky tribes innumerable, cried Yumi, camped on plains and steppes, on thousand mountains, worshipping the stars in thousand valleys, offering up first fruits till all the forests seem in flames where in fire the widow's spirit mounts to meet her lord o oh, orienda in thee tis vain to seek our yila how dark as death the night said mohi shaking the dew from his braids the heavens blaze not here with stars as over dominora's land and broad vivenza one only constellation was beheld but every star was brilliant as the one that promises the morning that constellation was the crux australis the badge and type of alma and now southwest we steered till another island vast was reached hamora far trending toward the antarctic pole coasting on by barbarous beaches where painted men with spears charged on all attempts to land at length we rounded a mighty bluff lit by a beacon and heard a bugle call bellows hurrying to their quarters the world ends garrison here the sea rolled high in mountain surges mid which we toiled and strained as if ascending cliffs of caucasus but not long thus as when from howling roetian heights the traveller spies green lombardy below and downward rushes toward that pleasant plain so sloping from long rolling swells at last we launched upon the calm lagoon but as we northward sailed, once more the storm trump blew, and charger like the seas ran mustering to the call. And in battalions crouched before a towering rock far distant from the main. No moon eclipsed in Egypt's skies looked half so lone. But from out that darkness on the loftiest peak, Bellows' standard waved. O oh, rifled tomb, cried Babalanja wherein lay the Mars and Moloch of our times, whose constellated crown was gemmed with diadems. Thou god of war, who didst seem the devouring beast of the apocalypse, casting so vast a shadow over Marty, that yet it lingers in old Frankel's vale, where still they started thy tremendous ghost, and late have hailed a phantom king. Almighty hero spell, that after the lapse of half a century, can so bewitch all hearts but one drop of hero blood will deify a fool franco thou wouldst be free yet thy free homage is to the buried ashes of a king thy first choice the exultation of his race in furious fires thou burnst ludwig's throne and over thy new-made chieftain's portal in golden letters princed the palace of our lord in thy new dispensation thou cleavest to the exploded law, and on freedom's altar, ah, I fear, still may slay thy hecatombs. But freedom turns away, she is sick with burnt blood of offerings. Other rituals she loves, and like Oro, unseen herself, would be worshipped only by invisibles. Of long-drawn cavalcades, pompous processions, frenzied banners mystic music marching nations she will none oh may thy peaceful future franco sanctify thy bloody past let not history say to her old gods she turned again this rocky islet passed the sea went down once more we neared hamora's western shore in the deep darkness here and there its margin was lit up by foam-white breaking billows rolled over from vivenza's strand 
and down from northward Dominora, marking places where light was breaking in, upon the interior's jungle gloom. In heavy sighs the night winds from shore came over us. "'Ah, vain to seek sweet Yila here,' cried Yumi. "'Poor land, cursed of man, not Oro. "'How thou faintest for thy children, torn from thy soil, to till a stranger's. "'Vivenza, did these winds not spend their plaints ere reaching thee, "'thy every veil would echo them. "'O tribe of Hamo, thy cup of woe so brims, "'that soon it must overflow upon the land which holds ye thralls. No misery born of crime, but spreads and poisons wide. Suffering hunteth sin, as the gaunt hound the hare, and tears it in the greenest breaks. Still on we sailed, and after many tranquil days and nights a storm came down, and burst its thousand bombs. The lightnings forked and flashed, the waters boiled, our three prows lifted themselves in supplication but the billows smote them as they reared. Said Babalanja, bowing to the blast, Thus, O Vivenza, retribution works. Though long delayed, it comes at last. Judgment with all her bolts. Now a current seized us, and like three darts, our keels sped eastward through a narrow strait, far in, upon a smooth expanse, an inland ocean without a throb. On our left, Porfiro's southwest point, a mighty rock, long tiers of galleries within, deck on deck, and flagstaffs like an admiral's masts, a line of battleship all purple stone and anchored in the sea. Here Bellows Lion crouched, and, through a thousand portholes, eyed the world. On our right, Hamora's northern shore gleamed thick with crescents, numerous as the crosses along the opposing strand. How vain to say that progress is the test of truth, my lord, said Babalanja, when after many centuries those crescents yet unwaning shine, and count a devotee for every worshipper of yonder crosses. Truth and merit have other symbols than success, and in this mortal race all competitors may enter, and the field is clear for all. Side by side lies run with truths, and fools with wise but like geometric lines, though they pierce infinity, never may they join. Over that tideless sea we sailed, and landed right and landed left, but the maiden never found, till at last we gained the water's limit, and inland saw great pointed masses crowned with halos. Granite continents, cried Babalanja, that seem created like the planets, not built with human hands. Lo, landmarks, upon whose flanks time leaves its traces, like old tide-rips of diluvian seas. As, after wandering round and round some purple dell, deep in a boundless prairie's heart, the baffled hunter plunges in, then, despairing, turns once more to gain the open plain. Even so we seekers now curved round our keels, and from that inland sea emerged, the universe again before us, our quest as wide. Chapter 65 Sailing On Morning dawned upon the same mild blue lagoon as erst, and all the lands that we had passed since leaving Pico's shore of spears were faded from the sight. Part and parcel of the Mardian Isles, they formed a cluster by themselves, like the Pleiades that shine in Taurus and are eclipsed by the red splendor of his fiery eye and the thick clusterings of the constellations round. And as in Orion, to some old king astronomer, say, king of Rigel or Betelgeuse, this earth's four quarters show but four points afar, so seem they to terrestrial eyes that broadly sweep the spheres. And as the sun, by influence divine, wheels through the ecliptic, threading Cancer, Leo, Pisces, and Aquarius, so by some mystic impulse am I moved to this fleet progress through the groups in white-reefed Marty's zone. O oh, reader, list! I've chartless voyaged. With compass and the lead, we had not found these Mardian Isles. 
those who boldly launch cast off all cables and turning from the common breeze that's fair for all with their own breath fill their own sails hug the shore naught new is seen and land ho at last was sung when a new world was sought that voyager steered his bark through seas untracked before ploughed his own path mid jeers though with a heart that oft was heavy with the thought that he might only be too bold and grope where land was none so i and though a saying but a sportive sail i was driven from my course by a blast resistless and ill provided young and bowed to the brunt of things before my prime still fly before the gale hard have i striven to keep stout heart and if it harder be than e'er before to find new climes when now our seas have oft been circled by ten thousand prows much more the glory but this new world here sought is stranger far than his who stretched his vans from palos it is the world of mind wherein the wanderer may gaze round with more of wonder than balboa's band roving through the golden aztec glades but fiery yearnings their own phantom future make and deem it present so if after all these fearful fainting trances the verdict be the golden haven was not gained yet in bold quest thereof better to sink in boundless deeps than float on vulgar shoals and give me ye gods an utter wreck if wreck i do End of section 13. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 14 of Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2 By Herman Melville Chapters 66 through 70 Chapter 66 A Flight of Nightingales from Yumi's Mouth By noon, down came a calm. O oh, Neva! good neva kind neva thy sweet breath dear neva so from his shark's mouth prayed little vivi to the god of fair breezes and along they swept till the three prows neighed to the blast and pranced on their path like steeds of crusaders now that this fine wind had sprung up the sun riding joyously in the heavens and the lagoon all tossed with white flying manes Medea called upon Yumi to ransack his whole assortment of songs, warlike, amorous, and sentimental, and regale us with something inspiring, for too long the company had been gloomy. Thy best, he cried. Then will I e'en sing you a song, my lord, which is a songful of songs. I composed it long, long since, when Yila yet bowered in Odo. Ere now, some fragments have been heard. Ah, Taji, in this my lay, live over again your happy hours. Some joys have thousand lives, can never die, for when they droop, sweet memories bind them up. My lord, I deem these verses good. They came bubbling out of me like live waters from a spring in a silver mine. And by your good leave, my lord, I have much faith in inspiration. Whoso sings is a seer. Tingling is the test, said Babalanja. Yumi, did you tingle when that song was composing? All over, Babalanja. From soul to crown? From finger to finger. My life for it, true poetry then, my lord, for this self-same tingling, I say, is the test and infused into a song cried yumi it evermore causes it so to sparkle vivify and irradiate that no son of man can repeat it without tingling himself this very song of mine may prove what i say modest youth sighed medea 
"'Not more so than sincere,' said Babalanja. "'He who is frank will often appear vain, my lord. "'Having no guile, he speaks as freely of himself as of another, "'and is just as ready to honour his own merits, even if imaginary, "'as to lament over undeniable deficiencies. "'Besides, such men are prone to moods which, to shallow-minded, unsympathising mortals, make their occasional distrust of themselves appear but as a phase of self-conceit. Whereas the man who, in the presence of his very friends, parades a barred and bolted front, that man so highly prizes his sweet self that he cares not to profane the shrine he worships by throwing open its portals. He is locked up, and ego is the key. Reserve alone is vanity but all mankind are egotists. The world revolves upon an I, and we upon ourselves, for we are our own worlds. All other men as strangers, from outlandish distant climes going clad in furs. Then, whate'er they be, let us show our worlds, and not seek to hide from men what Oro knows. Truth, my lord, said Yumi, but all this applies to men in mass, not specially to my poor craft. Of all mortals, we poets are most subject to contrary moods. Now heaven over heaven in the skies, now layer under layer in the dust. This the penalty we pay for being what we are. But Marty only sees, or thinks it sees, the tokens of our self-complacency, whereas all our agonies operate unseen. Poets are only seen when they soar. The song, the song, cried Medea, never mind the metaphysics of genius. And Yumi thus clamorously invoked him thrice tuning his voice for the air. But here be it said that the minstrel was miraculously gifted with three voices, and upon occasions like a mockingbird was a concert of sweet sounds in himself. Had kind friends died and bequeathed him their voices? But hark! In a low, mild tenor, he begins. Half railed above the hills, yet rosy bright, Stands fresh and fair the meek and blushing morn. So Yila looks, her pensive eyes the stars That mildly beam from out her cheek's young dawn. But the still meek dawn is not I the form Of Yila nor morn. Soon rises the sun, days race to run, his rays abroad flash each a sword, And merrily forth they flare, Sun music in the air. So Yila now rises and flashes, Rays shooting from aunt her long lashes, Sun music in the air. Her laugh, how it bounds, Bright cascade of sounds, Peal after peal, and ringing afar, Ringing of waters that silvery jar, From basin to basin fast falling. Fast falling and shining and streaming, Yila's bosom, the soft heaving lake, Where her laughs at last dimple and flake. O oh, beautiful Yila, thy step so free! Fast fly the sea ripples, revealing their dimples, When forth thou heist to the frolicsome sea. All the stars laugh when upward she looks, All the trees chat in their woody nooks, all the brooks sing, all the caves ring, all the buds blossom, all the boughs bound, all the birds carol, and leaves turn round where Yila looks. Light wells from her soul's deep sun, causing many toward her to run, vines to climb, and flowers to spring, and youths their love by hundreds bring. Proceed, gentle Yumi, said Babalanja. The meaning, said Mohi. The sequel, said Medea. My lord, I have ceased in the middle. The end is not yet. Mysticism, cried Babalanja. What minstrel? Must nothing ultimate come of all that melody? No final and inexhaustible meaning. Nothing that strikes down into the soul's depths? till, intent upon itself, it pierces in upon its own essence, and is resolved into its pervading original, becoming a thing constituent of the all-embracing deific, whereby we mortals become part and parcel of the gods, 
our souls to them as thoughts, and we privy to all things occult, ineffable, and sublime? Then, Yumi, is thy song nothing worth? Allah Malala saith, That is no true vital breath, which leaves no moisture behind. I mistrust thee, minstrel, that thou hast not yet been impregnated by the arcane mysteries, that thou dost not sufficiently ponder on the Adita, the Monads, and the Hyparxes, the Dianoeas, the Unical Hypostases, the Gnostic powers of the physical essence, and the supermundane and pleromatic triads, to say nothing of the abstract Numenans. Oro forbid, cried Yumi, the very sound of thy words affrights me. Then, whispering to Mohi, Is he daft again? My brain is battered, said Medea. Azageti, you must diet and be bled. Ah, sighed Babalanja, turning, How little they ween of the rudimental quincunxes and the hecatic spherula. Chapter 67 They Visit One Doxodox Next morning we came to a deep green wood, slowly nodding over the waves, its margin frothy white with foam. A charming sight. While delighted, all our paddlers gazed, Medea, observing Babalanja plunged in reveries, called upon him to awake, asking what might so absorb him. Ah, my lord, what seraphic sounds have ye driven from me? Sounds? Sure there's not heard but yonder murmuring surf. What other sound heard you? The thrilling of my soul's monochord, my lord. But prick not your ears to hear it. That divine harmony is overheard by the rapt spirit alone. It comes not by the auditory nerves. No more, Azageti, no more of that. Look yonder. A most lovely wood in truth, and methinks it is here the sage Doxodox, surnamed the Wise One, dwells. Hark! I hear the hootings of his owls, said Mohi. My lord, you must have read of him. He is said to have penetrated from the zoned to the unzoned principles. Shall we seek him out, that we may hearken to his wisdom? Doubtless he knows many things after which we pant. The lagoon was calm as we landed. Not a breath stirred the plumes of the trees. And as we entered the voiceless shades, lifting his hand, Babalanja whispered, This silence is a fit introduction to the portals of telestic lore. Somewhere beneath this moss lurks the mystic stone Nizurus, whereby Doxodox hath attained unto a knowledge of the ungenerated essences. Nightly he bathes his soul in archangelical circumlucencies. O oh, Doxodox, whip me the Strophalunian top. Tell o'er thy gingies. Down, Azageti, down, cried Medea. Behold, there sits the wise one. Now, for true wisdom. From the voices of the party, the sage must have been aware of our approach. But seated on a green bank beneath the shade of a red mulberry, upon the boughs of which many an owl was perched, he seemed intent upon describing diverse figures in the air, with a jet-black wand. Advancing with much deference and humility, Babalanja saluted him. O oh, wise Doxodox, drawn hither by thy illustrious name, we seek admittance to thy innermost wisdom. Of all Mardian, thou alone comprehendest those arcane combinations, whereby to drag to-day the most deftly hidden things, present and to come. Thou knowest what we are, and what we shall be. We beseech thee, evoke thy selms. Tetrads, Pentads, Hexads, Heptads, Ogdodes, meanest thou those? New terms all. Foiled at thy own weapons, said Medea. Then if thou comprehendest not my nomenclature, how my science? But let me test thee in the portico. Why is it that as some things extend more remotely than others, so quadimoditatives are larger than qualitatives? For as much as quadimoditatives extend to those things which include the quadimoditatives themselves. 
Asagetti has found his match, said Medea. Still posed, Babalanja? asked Mohi. At a loss, most truly. But I beseech thee, wise Doxodox, instruct me in thy dialectics, that I may embrace thy more recondite lore. To begin, then, my child, all dissibles reside in the mind. But what are dissibles? said Medea. Meanest thou perfect or imperfect dissibles? Any kind you please, but what are they? Perfect dissibles are of various sorts. Interrogative, percontative, adjurative, optative, imprecative, executive, substitutive, compellative, hypothetical, and lastly, dubious. Dubious enough, Azagetti. Forever hereafter hold thy peace. Ah, my children, I must go back to my axioms. And what are they, said old Mohi? Of various sorts, which again are diverse. Thus, my contrary axioms are disjunctive and subdisjunctive, and so with the rest. So too, in degree, with my syllogisms. And what of them? Did I not just hint what they were, my child? I repeat, they are of various sorts. Connex and conjunct, for example. And what of them, persisted Mohi, while Babalanja, arms folded, stood serious and mute, a sneer on his lip. As with other branches of my dialectics, so too, in their way, with my syllogisms. Thus, when I say, if it be warm, it is not cold, that's a simple assumption. If I add, but it is warm, that's an ass-umption so called from the syllogist himself, doubtless, said Mohi, stroking his beard. Poor ignorant babe! No. Listen, if finally I say. Therefore it is not cold that's the final inference. And a most triumphant one it is, cried Babalanja. Thrice profound and sapient doxodox, light of Marty and beacon of the universe, didst ever hear of the shark syllogism? Though thy epithets be true, my child, I distrust thy sincerity. I have not yet heard of the syllogism to which thou referrest. It was thus. A shark seized a swimmer by the leg. Addressing him, Friend, I will liberate you if you truly answer whether you think I purpose harm. Well knowing that sharks seldom were magnanimous, he replied, Kind sir, you mean me harm. Now go your ways. No, no, my conscience forbids. Nor will I falsify the words of so voracious a mortal. You were to answer truly, but you say I mean you harm. So harm it is. Here goes your leg. Profane jester, wouldst thou insult me with thy torn foolery? Be gone, all of ye. Tramp, pack, I say, away with ye and into the woods Doxodox himself disappeared. Bravely done, Babalanja, cried Medea. You turn the corner to admiration. I have hopes of our philosopher yet, said Mohi. Outrageous impostor, fool, dotard, oaf, did he think to bejuggle me with his preposterous gibberish? And is this shallow phrase man the renowned Doxodox whom I have been taught so highly to reverence? Alas, alas, a donfi there is none. His fit again, sighed Yumi. Chapter 68 King Medea Dreams That afternoon was melting down to eve, all but Medea broad awake, yet all motionless as the slumber upon the purple mat. Sailing on, with open eyes, we slept the wakeful sleep of those who to the body only give repose, while the spirit still toils on, threading her mountain passes. King Medea's slumbers were like the helmed sentries in the saddle. From them he started like an antlered deer, bursting from out a copse. Some said he never slept, that deep within himself he but intensified the hour or, leaving his crown brow in marble quiet, unseen, departed to far-off councils of the gods. 
howbeit his lids never closed. In the noonday sun those crystal eyes like diamonds sparkled with a fixed light. As motionless we thus reclined, Medea turned and muttered, Brother gods and demigods, it is not well. These mortals should have less or more. Among my subjects is a man whose genius scorns the common theories of things, but whose still mortal mind cannot fathom the ocean at his feet. His soul's a hollow wherein he raves. List, list, whispered Yumi. Our lord is dreaming, and what a royal dream. A very royal and imperial dream, said Babalanja. He is arraigning me before high heaven. Ay, ay. In dreams, at least, he deems himself a demigod. Hist, said Mohi, he speaks again. Gods and demigods, with one gesture, all abysses we may disclose, and before this Marty's eyes evoke the shrouded time to come. Were this well, like lost children groping in the woods, they falter through their tangled paths, and at a thousand angles baffled, start upon each other and even when they make an onward move, tis but an endless vestibule that leads to naught. In my own isle of Odo, 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 how rules my viceroy there? Down, down, ye madding mobs! Ho, spearmen, charge! By the firmament but my halberdiers fly. His dream has changed, said Babalanja. He is in Odo whither his anxieties impel him. Hist, hist, said Yumi. I leap upon the soil, render thy account, Almani. Where's my throne? Mohi, am I not a king? Do not thy chronicles record me? Yumi, am I not the soul of some one glorious song? Babalanja, speak. Mohi, Yumi. What is it, my lord? Thou dost but dream. Staring wildly, then calmly gazing round, Medea smiled. Ha! How we royalties ramble in our dreams! I've told no secrets. While he seemed to sleep, my lord spoke much, said Mohi. I knew it not, old man, nor would now, but that ye tell me. We dream not ourselves, said Babalanja, but the thing within us. I? Good morrow, Azagedi. But come, no more dreams. Vivi, wine. And straight through that live-long night, immortal Medea plied the can. Chapter 69 After a long interval, by night they are becalmed. Now suns rose and set, moons grew and waned, till at last the star that erewhile heralded the dawn presage the eve, to us, sad token. While deep within the deepest heart of Marty's circle, we sailed from sea to sea, and isle to isle, and group to group, vast empires explored, and inland valleys to their utmost heads, and for every ray in heaven beheld a king. Needless to recount all that then befell. What tribes and caravans we saw! What vast horizons, boundless plains and sierras, in their every intervale a nation nestling, enough that still we roamed. It was evening, and as the red sun, magnified, launched into the wave once more from a wild strand, we launched our three canoes. Soon from her clouds, hooded night, like a nun from a convent, drew nigh. Rustled her train, yet no spangles were there. But high on her brow still shone her pale crescent, haloed by bandolets, violet, red, and yellow. So looked the lone watcher through her rainbow iris, so sad the night without stars. The winds were laid, the lagoon still as a prairie of an August noon. Let us dream out the calm, said Medea. One of ye paddlers, watch. Ho, companions, who's for Cathay? Sleep reigned throughout the canoes, sleeping upon the waters. But nearer and nearer, low-creeping along, came mists and vapors, a thousand, 
spotted with twinklings of will-o'-wisps from neighboring shores. Dusky leopards stealing on by crouches, those vapors seemed. Hours silently passed. When, startled by a cry, Taji sprang to his feet, against which something rattled. Then, a quick splash, and a dark form bounded into the lagoon. The dozing watcher had called aloud, and, about to stab, the assassin, dropping his stiletto, plunged. Peering hard through those treacherous mists, two figures in a shallop were a spy dragging another dripping from the brine. Foiled again, and foiled forever. No foe's corpse was I. As we gazed, in the gloom quickly vanished the shallop, ere ours could be reversed to pursue. Then from the opposite mists glided a second canoe, and beneath the iris round the moon shone now another, Hautia's flowery flag. Vain to wave the sirens off, so still they came. One waved a plant of sickly silver green. The midnight tremula, cried Yumi, the falling star of flowers. Still I come, when least foreseen, then flee. The second waved a hemlock top, the spike just tapering its final point. The third, a convolvulus, half closed. The end draws nigh, and all thy hopes are waning. Then they proffered grapes. But once more waved off, silently they vanished. Again the buried barb tore at my soul. Again Yila was invoked, but Hatia made reply. Slowly wore out the night, but when up rose the sun, fled clouds and fled sadness. Chapter 70 they land at Hulumulu. Keep all three prows for yonder rock, cried Medea. No sadness on this merry morn, and now for the Isle of Cripples, even Hulumulu. The Isle of Cripples? Ay, why not? Mohi, tell how they came to club. In substance, this was the narration. Averse to the barbarous custom of destroying at birth all infants not symmetrically formed, but equally desirous of removing from their sight those unfortunate beings, the islanders of a neighboring group had long ago established an asylum for cripples, where they lived subject to their own regulations, ruled by a king of their own election. In short, forming a distinct class of beings by themselves. One only restriction was placed upon them. On no account must they quit the isle assigned them. And to the surrounding islanders, so unpleasant the sight of a distorted mortal that a stranger landing at Hulumulu was deemed a prodigy. Wherefore, respecting any knowledge of aught beyond them, the cripples were well nigh as isolated as if Hulumulu was the only terra firma extant. Dwelling in a community of their own, these unfortunates, who otherwise had remained few in number, increased and multiplied greatly. Nor did successive generations improve in symmetry upon those preceding them. Soon we drew nigh to the isle. Heaped up and jagged with rocks, and here and there covered with dwarfed, twisted thickets, it seemed a fit place for its denizens. Landing, we were surrounded by a heterogeneous mob, and thus escorted, took our way inland toward the abode of their lord, King Yoki. What a scene! Here, helping himself along with two crotched roots, hobbled a dwarf without legs. Another stalked before, one arm fixed in the air like a lightning rod. A third, more active than any, seal-like, flirted a pair of flippers and went skipping along. A fourth hopped on a solitary pin, at every bound, spinning round like a top, to gaze. While still another, furnished with feelers or fins, rolled himself up in a ball, bowling over the ground in advance. With curious instinct, the blind stuck close to our side. With their chattering finger, the deaf and the dumb described angles, obtuse and acute, in the air. And like stones rolling down rocky ravines, scores of stammerers stuttered. Discord wedded deformity. 
all asses brays were now harmonious memories all calibans as angels yet for every stare we gave them three stares they gave us at last we halted before a tenement of rude stones crooked banyan boughs its rafters thatched with fantastic leaves so rambling and irregular its plan it seemed thrown up by the eruption according to sage mohi the origin of the isle itself entering we saw king yoki ah sadly lacking was he in all the requisites of an efficient ruler deaf and dumb he was and save arms minus everything but an indispensable trunk and head so huge his all comprehensive mouth it seemed to swallow up itself but shapeless helpless as was yoki as king of hulumulu he was competent the state being a limited monarchy of which his highness was but the passive and ornamental head as his visitors advanced he fell to gossiping with his fingers a servitor interpreting very curious to note the rapidity with which motion was translated into sound and the simultaneousness with which meaning made its way through four successive channels to the mind hand sight voice and typanum much amazement his highness now expressed horrified his glances why club such frights as ye heard ye to keep in countenance or are afraid of your own hideousness that ye dread to go alone monsters speak great oro cried mohi are we then taken for cripples by the very king of the cripples my lord are not our legs and arms all right comelier ones were never turned by turners mohi but royal yoki in sooth we feel abashed before thee some further stares were then exchanged when his highness sought to know whether there were any comparative anatomists among his visitors comparative anatomists not one and why may king yoki ask that question inquired babalanja then was made the following statement during the latter part of his reign when he seemed fallen into his dotage the venerable predecessor of king yoki had been much attached to an old gray-headed chimpanzee one day found meditating in the woods rozoko was his name he was very grave and reverend of aspect much of a philosopher to him all gnarled and knotty subjects were familiar in his day he had cracked many a crabbed nut and so in love with his Timonian solitude was Rizoko that it needed many bribes and bland persuasions to induce him to desert his mossy, hillside misanthropic cave for the distracting tumult of a court. But ere long, promoted to high offices and made the royal favorite, the woodland sage forgot his forests, and love for love returned the aged king's caresses. Ardent friends they straight became, dined and drank together with quivering lips quaffed long-drawn sober bumpers comparing all their past experiences and canvassing those hidden themes on which octogenarians dilate for when the fires and broils of youth are past and marty wears its truer aspect then we love to think not act the present seems more unsubstantial than the past then we seek out gray beards like ourselves and hold discourse of palsies hearses shrouds and tombs appoint our undertakers our mantles gather round us like to winding sheets and every night lie down to die then the world's great bubble bursts then life's clouds seem sweeping by revealing heaven to our straining eyes then we tell our beads and murmur paternosters and in trembling accents cry oro be merciful so the monarch and rozoko but not always were they thus of bright cheerful mornings they took slow tottering rambles in the woods nodding over grotesque walking sticks of the chimpanzee's handiwork for sedate rozoko was a dilettante arborist an amateur in canes indeed canes at last became his hobby 
for half daft with age, sometimes he straddled his good staff and gently rode abroad, to take the salubrious evening air, deeming it more befitting exercise at times than walking. Into this menage he soon initiated his friend the king, and side by side they often pranced, or, wearying of the saddle, dismounted and paused to ponder over prostrate palms decaying across the path. Their mystic rings they counted, and for every ring a year in their own calendars. Now so closely did the monarch cleave to the chimpanzee, that, in good time, summoning his subjects, earnestly he charged it on them, that, at death, he and his faithful friend should be buried in one tomb. It came to pass the monarch died, and poor Rosoko, now reduced to second childhood, wailed most dismally. No one slept that night in Hulumulu, never did he leave the body, and at last, slowly going round it thrice, he laid him down, close nestled, and noiselessly expired. The king's injunctions were remembered, and one vault received them both. Moon followed moon, and wrought upon by jeers and taunts, the people of the isle became greatly scandalized that a base-born baboon should share the shroud of their departed lord, though they themselves had tucked in the aged Aeneas fast by the side of his Achates. They straight resolved to build another vault, and over it a lofty cairn, and thither carry the remains they reverenced. But at the disinterring a sad perplexity arose, for lo surpassing Saul and Jonathan, not even in decay were these fast friends divided. So mingled every relic, Ilium and Ulna, Carpus and Metacarpus, and so similar the corresponding parts that, like the literary remains of Beaumont and of Fletcher, which was which, no spectacles could tell. Therefore they desisted, lest the towering monument they had reared might commemorate an ape and not a king. Such the narration. Hearing which, my lord Medea kept stately silent, but in courtly phrase, as beseemed him, Babalanja, turban in hand, thus spoke. My concern is extreme, King Yoki, at the embarrassment into which your island is thrown, nor less my grief that I myself am not the man to put an end to it. I could weep that comparative anatomists are not so numerous now as hereafter they assuredly must become, when their services shall be in greater request, when at last, last day of all, millions of noble and ignoble spirits will loudly clamor for lost skeletons, when contending claimants shall start up for one poor carious spine, and dog-like we shall quarrel over our own bones. Then entered dwarf stewards and major-domos, aloft bearing twisted antlers, all hollowed out in goblets, grouped, announcing dinner. Loving not, however, to dine with misshapen Mardians, King Medea was loath to move. But Babalanja, quoting the old proverb, Strike me in the face but refuse not my yams, induced him to sacrifice his fastidiousness. So under a flourish of ram-horn bugles, court and company proceeded to the banquet. Central was a long, dislocated trunk of a wild banyan, like a huge centipede crawling on its hundred branches, sawn of even lengths for legs. This table was set out with wry-necked gourds, deformities of calabashes, and shapeless trenchers dug out of knotty woods. The first course was shrimp soup, served in great clamp-shells. The second, lobsters, cuttlefish, crabs, cockles, crayfish. The third, hunch-backed roots of the taro plant, plantains perversely curling at the end, like the inveterate tails of pertinacious pigs. And for dessert, ill-shaped melons, huge as idiots' heads, plainly suffering from water in the brain. Now these viands were commended to the favorable notice of all guests, not only for their delicacy of flavor, but for their symmetry. And in the intervals of the courses, we were bored with hints to admire numerous objects of virtu, bow-legged stools of mangrove wood, zigzag rapiers of bone, armlets of grampus vertebrae, 
outlandish tureens of the calipes of terrapin, and canakins of the skulls of baboons. The banquet over, with many congees, we withdrew. Returning to the waterside, we passed a field where dwarfs were laboring in beds of yams, heaping the soil around the roots by scratching it backward as a dog. All things in readiness, Yoki's valet, a tri-armed dwarf, treated us to a glorious start by giving each canoe a vigorous triple push, crying, Away with ye, monsters! Nor must it be omitted that, just previous to embarking, Vivi, spying a curious-looking stone, turned it over and found a snake. End of section 14 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 15 of Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2. By Herman Melville. Chapters 71 through 75. Chapter 71. A Book from the Ponderings of Old Bardiana. Now, said Babalanja, lighting his trombone as we sailed from the isle, who are the monsters, we or the cripples? You yourself are a monster, for asking the question, said Mohi. And so to the cripples I am, though not, old man, for the reason you mention. But I am as I am whether hideous or handsome depends upon who is made judge there is no supreme standard yet revealed whereby to judge of ourselves our very instincts are prejudices saith Allah molala our very axioms and postulates are far from infallible in respect of the universe mankind is but a sect saith deloro and first principles but dogmas what ethics prevail in the pleiades what things have the synods in Sagittarius decreed? Never mind your old authors, said Medea. Stick to the cripples. Enlarge upon them. But I have done with them now, my lord. The sermon is not the text. Give ear to old Bardiana. I know him by heart. Thus saith the sage in Book Ten of the Ponderings Zermalmende, the title Je Pense, the motto my supremacy over creation, boasteth man, is declared in my natural attitude. I stand erect, but so do the palm trees, and the giraffes that graze off their tops, and the fowls of the air fly high over our heads, and from the place where we fancy our heaven to be, defile the tops of our temples. Be like the eagles, from their eyries, Look down upon us Mardians in our hives, even as upon the beavers in their dams, marveling at our incomprehensible ways. And cunning though we be, some things hidden from us may not be mysteries to them. Having five keys, hold we all that open to knowledge? Deaf, blind, and deprived of the power of scent, the bat will steer its way unerringly. Could we? Yet man is lord of the bat and the brute. Lord over the crows, with whom he must needs share the grain he garners. We sweat for the fowls as well as ourselves. The curse of labor rests only on us. Like slaves, we toil. At their good leisure, they glean. Marty is not wholly ours. We are the least populous part of creation. To say nothing of other tribes, a census of the herring would find us far in the minority. And what life is to us, sour or sweet, so is it to them. Like us, they die, fighting death to the last. Like us, they spawn and depart. We inhabit but a crust, rough surfaces, odds and ends of the isles, the abounding lagoon being its two-thirds, its grand feature from afar, and forever unfathomable. What shaft has yet been sunk to the antipodes? What underlieth the gold mines? 
but even here above ground we grope with the sun at meridian vainly we seek our northwest passages old alleys and thoroughfares of the whales o oh, men fellow men we are only what we are not what we would be nor everything we hope for we are but a step in a scale that reaches further above us than below we breathe but oxygen who in arcturus hath heard of us they know us not in the milky way we prate of faculties divine and know not how sprouteth a spear of grass we go about shrugging our shoulders when the firmament arch is over us we rant of etherealities and long tarry over our banquets we demand eternity for a lifetime when our mortal half-hours too often prove tedious we know not of what we talk the bird of paradise outflies our flutterings what it is to be immortal has not yet entered into our thoughts at will we build our futurities tier above tier all galleries full of laureates resounding with everlasting oratorios paternosters forever or eternal miseraries forgetting that in mardi our breviaries oft fall from our hands but divans there are some say whereon we shall recline basking in effulgent suns knowing neither orient nor occident is it so fellow men our mortal lives have an end but that end is no goal no place of repose whatever it may be it will prove but as the beginning of another race we will hope joy weep as before though our tears may be such as the spice trees shed supine we can only be annihilated the thick film is breaking the ages have long been circling fellow men if we live hereafter it will not be in lyrics nor shall we yawn and our shadows lengthen while the eternal cycles are revolving to live at all is a high vocation to live forever and run parallel with oro may truly appall us toil we not here and shall we be forever slothful elsewhere other worlds differ not much from this but in degree doubtless a pebble is a fair specimen of the universe we point at random peradventure at this instant there are beings gazing up to this very world as their future heaven but the universe is all over a heaven nothing but stars on stars throughout infinities of expansion all we see are but a cluster could we get to Boötes, we would be no nearer Oro than now. He hath no place but is here. Already in its unimaginable roamings, our system may have dragged us through and through the spaces where we plant cities of beryl and jasper. Even now, we may be inhaling the ether which we fancy seraphic wings are fanning. But look around. There is much to be seen here and now. Do the archangels survey aught more glorious than the constellations we nightly behold? Continually we slight the wonders we deem in reserve. We await the present. With marvels we are glutted, till we hold them no marvels at all. But had these eyes first opened upon all the prodigies in the revelation of the dreamer, long familiarity would have made them appear even as these things we see. Now now the page is outspread to the simple easy as a primer to the wise more puzzling than hieroglyphics the eternity to come is but a prolongation of time present and the beginning may be more wonderful than the end then let us be wise but much of the knowledge we seek already we have in our cores yet so simple it is we despise it so bold we fear it in solitude let us exhume our ingots let us hear our own thoughts the soul needs no mentor but oro and oro without proxy wanting him it is both the teacher and the taught undeniably reason was the first revelation and so far as it tests all others it has precedence over them it comes direct to us without suppression or interpolation 
and with Oro's indisputable imprimatur. But inspiration though it be, it is not so arrogant as some think. Nay, far too humble at times, it submits to the grossest indignities. Though in its best estate not infallible, so far as it goes, for us, it is reliable. When at fault, it stands still. We speak not of visionaries. But if this our first revelation stops short of the uttermost, so with all others. If often it only perplexes, much more the rest. They leave much expounded, and disclosing new mysteries, add to the enigma. Fellow men, the ocean we would sound is unfathomable, and however much we add to our line, when it is out, we feel not the bottom. Let us be truly lowly, then, not lifted up with a pharisaic humility. We crawl not like worms, nor wear we the liveries of angels. The firmament arch has no keystone, least of all is man its prop. He stands alone. We are everything to ourselves, but how little to others. What are others to us? A sure life everlasting to this generation and their immediate forefathers, and what tears would flow, were there no resurrection for the countless generations from the first man to five cycles since? And soon we ourselves shall have fallen in with the rank and file of our sires. At a blow, annihilate some distant tribe, now alive and jocund, and what would we wreck? Curiosity apart, do we really care whether the people in Bellatrix are immortal or no? Though they smite us, let us not turn away from these things, if they be really thus. There was a time when near Cassiopeia, a star of the first magnitude, most lustrous in the north, grew lurid as a fire, then dim as ashes, and went out. Now its place is a blank. A vast world with all its continents, say the astronomers, blazing over the heads of our fathers, while in Marty were merrymakings and maidens given in marriage. Who now thinks of that burning sphere? How few are aware that ever it was. These things are so. Fellow men, we must go and obtain a glimpse of what we are from the belts of Jupiter and the moons of Saturn, ere we see ourselves aright. The universe can wax old without us, though by Otto's grace we may live to behold a wrinkle in the sky. Eternity is not ours by right, and alone unrequited sufferings here form no title thereto unless resurrections are reserved for maltreated brutes. Suffering is suffering, be the sufferer man, brute, or thing. How small, how nothing our deserts! Let us stifle all vain speculations. We need not be told what righteousness is. We were born with the whole law in our hearts. Let us do. Let us act. Let us down on our knees. And if, after all, we should be no more forever, far better to perish meriting immortality than to enjoy it unmeritorious. While we fight over creeds, Ten thousand fingers point to where vital good may be done. All round us, want crawls to her lairs, and, shivering, dies unrelieved. Here, here, fellow men, we can better minister as angels than in heaven, where want and misery come not. We Mardians talk as though the future was all in all, but act as though the present was everything. Yet so far as, in our theories, we dwarf our Marty, we go not beyond an archangel's apprehension of it, who takes in all suns and systems at a glance. Like pebbles, were the isles to sink in space, Sirius the dog-star would still flame in the sky. But as the atom to the animalculi, so Marty to us. And lived aright, these mortal lives are long. Looked into, these souls, fathomless as the nethermost depths. Fellow men, we split upon hairs, but stripped, mere words and phrases cast aside, the great bulk of us are orthodox. None who think dissent from the grand belief. The first man's thoughts were as ours. The paramount revelation prevails with us. 
and all that clashes therewith, we do not so much believe as believe that we cannot disbelieve. Common sense is a sturdy despot, that for the most part has its own way. It inspects and ratifies much independent of it. But those who think they do wholly reject it are but held in a sly sort of bondage, under a semblance of something else wearing the old yoke. Cease. Cease, Babalanja, said Medea, and permit me to insinuate a word in your ear. You have long been in the habit, philosopher, of regaling us with chapters from your old Bardiana, and with infinite gusto you have just recited the longest of all. But I do not observe, O oh sage, that for all these things you yourself are practically the better or wiser. You live not up to Bardiana's main thought. Where he stands, he stands immovable. But you are a dog vein. How is this? Gogol goggle fugle fee, fugle fogle orum. Madman again, cried Yumi. Chapter 72 Babalanja Starts to His Feet. For twenty four hours, seated stiff and motionless, Babalanja spoke not a word, then, almost without moving a muscle, muttered thus At banquets, surfeit not, but fill. Partake and retire, and eat not again till you crave. Thereby you give nature time to work her magic transformings, turning all solids to meat and wine into blood. After a banquet, you incline to repose. Do so. Digestion commands. All this follow those who feast at the tables of wisdom, and all such are they who partake of the fare of old Bardiana. Art resuscitated then, Babalanja, said Medea. Ay, my lord, I am just risen from the dead. And did Azageti conduct you to their realms? Fangs off, fangs off, depart, thou fiend, unhand me, or by Oro I will die and spite thee. Quick, quick, Mohi, let us change places, cried Yumi. How now, Babalanja, said Medea. O oh, my lord man, not you, my lord Medea, high and mighty puissance, great king of creation. Thou art but the biggest of braggarts. In every age thou boastest of thy valorous advances. Flat fools, old dotards and numbskulls, our sires. All the past wasted time. The present knows all. Right lucky fellow beings we live now. Every man an author. Books plenty as men, strike a light in a minute, teeth sold by the pound, all the elements fetching and carrying, lightning running on errands, rivers made to order, the ocean a puddle. But ages back they boasted like us, and ages to come, forever and ever, they'll boast. Ages back they blackballed the past, thought the last day was come, so wise they were grown. Marty could not stand long, have to annex one of the planets, invade the great sun, colonize the moon. Conquerors sighed for new Martys, and sages for heaven, having by heart all the primers here below. Like us, ages back, they groaned under their books, made bonfires of libraries, leaving ashes behind, mid which we reverentially grope for charred pages, forgetting we are so much wiser than they. But amazing times, astounding revelations, preternatural divulgings. How now? More wonderful than all our discoveries is this, that they never were discovered before. So simple, no doubt our ancestors overlooked them, intent on deeper things, the deep things of the soul. All we discover has been with us since the sun began to roll, and much we discover is not worth the discovering. We are children climbing trees after birds' nests and making a great shout, whether we find eggs in them or no. But where are our wings, which our forefathers surely had not? Tell us, ye sages, something worth an archangel's learning. Discover, ye discoverers, something new. Fools, fools! Marty's not changed. 
the sun yet rises in its old place in the east. All things go on in the same old way. We cut our eye teeth just as late as they did three thousand years ago. Your pardon, said Mohi, for beshrew me, they are not yet all cut. At three score and ten, here have I a new tooth coming now. Old man, it but clears the way for another. The teeth sown by the alphabet founder were eye teeth, not yet all sprung from the soil. Like spring wheat, blade by blade they break ground late. Like spring wheat, many seeds have perished in the hard winter glebe. O oh, my lord, though we galvanize corpses into St. Vitus's dances, we raise not the dead from their graves. Though we have discovered the circulation of the blood, men die as of yore. Oxen graze, sheep bleat, babies bawl, asses bray, loud and lusty as the day before the flood. Men fight and make up, repent and go at it, feast and starve, laugh and weep, pray and curse, cheat, chaffer, trick, truckle, cozen, defraud, fib, lie, beg, borrow, steal, hang, drown. As in the laughing and weeping, tricking and truckling, hanging and drowning times that have been. Nothing changes. Though much be new fashioned, new fashions but revivals of things previous. In the books of the past we learn naught but of the present. In those of the present, the past. All Marty's history, beginning middle and finis, was written out in capitals and the first page penned. The whole story is told in a title page. An exclamation point is entire Marty's autobiography. Who speaks now, said Medea, Bardiana, Azagheri, or Babalanja? All three. Is it not a pleasant concert? Very fine, very fine. Go on and tell us something of the future. I have never departed this life yet, my lord. But just now you said you were risen from the dead. From the buried dead within me, not from myself, my lord. If you then know nothing of the future, did Bardiana? If he did, not did he reveal. I have ever observed, my lord, that even in their deepest lucubrations, the profoundest, frankest ponderers always reserve a vast deal of precious thought for their own private behoof. They think, perhaps, that tis too good or too bad, too wise or too foolish for the multitude. And this unpleasant vibration is ever consequent upon striking a new vein of ideas in the soul. As with buried treasures, the ground over them sounds strange and hollow. At any rate, the profoundest ponderer seldom tells us all he thinks, seldom reveals to us the ultimate and the innermost, seldom makes us open our eyes under water, seldom throws open the totus in toto, and never carries us with him to the unconsubsistent, the idia emanans, the superessential, and the one. Confusion. Remember the quatamaditatives? Ah, said Braidbeard, that's the crack in his calabash, which all the disciples of Dox Dox will not mend. And from that crazy calabash he gives us to drink, old Mohi. But never heed his leaky gourd nor its contents, my lord. Let these philosophers muddle themselves as they will. We wise ones refuse to partake. And fools like me drink till they reel, said Babalanja. But in these matters one's calabash must needs go round to keep afloat. Fogalorum. Chapter 73 At last the last mention is made of old Bardiana, and his last will and testament is recited at length. The day was waning, and, as after many a tale of ghosts around their forest fire, Hungarian gypsies silent sit, watching the ruddy glow kindling each other's faces. So now we solemn sat, the crimson west our fire, all our faces flushed. Testators, then cried Medea, when your last wills are all round settled, speak and make it known. Mine, my lord, has long been fixed, said Babalanja. And how runs it? 
Fugelfogel. Hark ye, intruding Azagetti, rejoin thy merry mates below. Go there and wag thy saucy tail, or I will nail it to our bow, till ye roar for liberation. Be gone, I say. Down, devil, deeper down, rumbled Babalanja. My lord, I think he's gone, and now, by your good leave, I'll repeat old Bardiana's will. It's worth all Marty's hearing, and I have so studied it, by rote I know it. Proceed, then, but I mistrust that Azagetti is not yet many thousand fathoms down. Attend, my lord, Anno Marty's fifty million, O.S., I, Bardiana, of the island of Vamba, and village of the same name, having just risen from my yams, in high health, high spirits, and sound mind, do hereby cheerfully make and ordain this my last will and testament. Imprimis. All my kith and kin being well to do in Marty, I wholly leave them out of this my will. Item. Since, in diverse ways, verbally and otherwise, my good friend Pondo has evinced a strong love for me, Bardiana, as the owner and proprietor of all that capital messuage with the appurtenances in Vamba aforesaid, called the Lair, wherein I now dwell, also, for all my breadfruit orchards, palm groves, banana plantations, taro patches, gardens, lawns, lanes, and hereditaments whatsoever, adjoining the aforesaid messuage, I do hereby give and bequeath the same to Bombloom of the island of Ada, the aforesaid Bombloom having never expressed any regard for me as a holder of real estate. Item. My esteemed neighbor, Lacrimo, having since the last lunar eclipse called daily to inquire after the state of my health, and having nightly made tearful inquiries of my herb doctor concerning the state of my viscera, I do hereby give and bequeath to the aforesaid lacrimo all and sundry those vegetable pills, potions, powders, aperients, purgatives, expellatives, evacuatives, tonics, emetics, cathartics, clysters, injections, scarifiers, cataplasms, lenatives, lotions, decoctions, washes, gargles, and fledgemagogues, together with all the jars, calabashes, gourds, and gallipots thereunto pertaining, situate, lying, and being, in the west by north corner of my east-southeast crypt, in my aforesaid tenement, known as the lair. Item. The woman Pesti, a native of Vamba, Having oftentimes hinted that I, Bardiana, sorely needed a spouse, and having also intimated that she bore me a conjugal affection, I do hereby give and bequeath to the aforesaid Pesti my blessing, forasmuch as by the time of the opening of this my last will and testament, I shall have been forever delivered from the aforesaid Pesti's persecutions. Item Having a high opinion of the probity of my worthy and excellent friend Bididi, I do hereby entirely and wholly give, will, grant, bestow, devise, and utterly hand over unto the said Bididi all that tenement where my servant Orem now dwelleth, with all the lawns, meadows, uplands, and lowlands, fields, groves, and gardens thereunto belonging, in trust, nevertheless, to have and to hold the same for the sole use and benefit of Lanbranca Hohina, spinster, now resident of the aforesaid island of Vamba. Item. I give and bequeath my large carved drinking gourd to my good comrade Topo. Item. My fast friend Doldrum, having at sundry times and in sundry places uttered the prophecy that upon my decease his sorrow would be great, I do hereby give and bequeath to the aforesaid Doldrum ten yards of my best soft tapa, to be divided into handkerchiefs for his sole benefit and behoof. Item. My sensible friend Solo, having informed me that he intended to remain a bachelor for life, I give and devise to the aforesaid Solo the mat for one person, whereon I nightly repose. Item. Concerning my private arbor and palm groves, adjoining, lying, and being in the Isle of Vamba, 
I give and devise the same, with all appurtenances whatsoever, to my friend Minta the Cynic, to have and to hold, in trust, for the first through and through honest man, issue of my neighbor Mondi. And in default of such issue, for the first through and through honest man, issue of my neighbor Pendetta. And in default of such issue, for the first through and through honest man, issue of my neighbor Wynodo. And in default of such issue, to any through and through honest man, issue of anybody, to be found through the length and breadth of Marty. Item. My friend Menta the Cynic, to be sole judge of all claims to the above-mentioned devise, and to hold the said premises for his own use, until the aforesaid person be found. Item. Knowing my devoted scribe Marco to be very sensitive touching the receipt of a favor, I willingly spare him that pain, and hereby bequeath unto the aforesaid scribe three milk-teeth, not as a pecuniary legacy, but as a very slight token of my profound regard. Item. I give to the poor of Vamba the total contents of my red-labeled bags of bicuspids and canines, which I account three-fourths of my whole estate. To my body-servant Fiddy, my staff, all my robes and tongas, and three hundred molars in cash. To that discerning and sagacious philosopher, my disciple Craco, one complete set of denticles, to buy him a vertebral bone ring. And to that pious and promising youth, Vanji, two fathoms of my best kayar rope, with the privilege of any bow in my groves. All the rest of my goods, chattels, and household stuff whatsoever, and all my loose denticles remaining after my debts and legacies are paid, and my body is out of sight, I hereby direct to be distributed among the poor of Vamba. Ultimo. I give and bequeath to all Marty this my last advice and counsel. Vitalicit. Live as long as you can. Close your own eyes when you die. I have no previous wills to revoke, and publish this to be my first and last. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my right hand, and hereunto have caused a true copy of the tattooing on my right temple to be affixed during the year first above written. By me, Bardiana. Babalanja, that's an extraordinary document, said Medea. Bardiana was an extraordinary man, my lord. Were there no codicils? The will is all codicils, all afterthoughts. Ten thoughts for one act, was Bardiana's motto. Left he nothing whatever to his kindred? Not a stump. Prom his will he seems to have lived single. Yes, Bardiana never sought to improve upon nature. A bachelor he was born, and a bachelor he died. According to the best accounts, how did he depart, Babalanja? asked Mohi. With a firm lip, and his hand on his heart, old man. His last words? Calmer and better. Where think you he is now? In his ponderings. And those, my lord, we all inherit. For like the great chief of Ramara, who made a whole empire his legatee, so great authors have all Marty for an heir. Chapter 74 A Death Cloud Sweeps By Them As They Sail Next day, a fearful sight. As in Sulu's seas, one vast waterspout will, sudden, form, and whirling, chase the flying melee keels. So... Before a swift-winged cloud, a thousand prows sped by, leaving braided, foaming wakes. Their crowded inmates' arms, in frenzied supplications, wreathed, like tangled forest boughs. See, see, cried Yumi, how the death cloud flies? Let us dive down in the sea. Nay, said Babalanja, all things come of Oro. If we must drown, let Oro drown us. Down sails, drop paddles, said Medea. Here we float. Like a rushing bison sweeping by, the death cloud grazed us with its foam, and whirling in upon the thousand prows beyond, sudden burst in deluges, and scooping out a maelstrom, dragged down every plank and soul. Long we rocked upon the circling billows, which, expanding from that center, dashed every isle, 
till moons afterward, faint, they laved all Marty's reef. Thanks unto Oro, murmured Mohi. This heart still beats. That sun-flushed eve, we sailed by many tranquil harbors whence fled those thousand prows. Serene, the waves ran up their strands, and chimed around the unharmed stakes of palm to which the thousand prows that morning had been fastened. Flying death, they ran to meet it, said Babalanja. But tis not that they fled. They died. For maelstroms of these harbors, the death cloud might have made. But they died because they might not longer live. Could we gain one glimpse of the great calendar of eternity, all our names would there be found, glued against their dates of death. We die by land and die by sea. We die by earthquakes, famines, plagues, and wars. By fevers, agues, woe or mirth excessive. This mortal air is one wide pestilence that kills us all at last. Whom the death cloud spares sleeping dies in silent watches of the night. He whom the spears of many battles could not slay dies of a grapestone beneath the vine-clad bower he built to shade declining years. We die because we live, but none the less does Babalanja quake. And if he flies not, tis because he stands the center of a circle, its every point a leveled dart, and every bow bent back, a twang, and Babalanja dies. Chapter 75 They Visit the Palmy King Abrasa Night and morn departed, and in the afternoon we drew nigh to an island overcast with shadows. A shower was falling, and pining plaintive notes forth issued from the groves, half suppressed and sobbing whisperings of leaves. The shore sloped to the water. Thither our prows were pointed. Sheer off, no landing here, cried Medea. Let us gain the sunny side, and like the carefree bachelor Abrasa, who here is king, turn our back on the isle's shadowy side, and revel in its morning meads. And Lord Abrasa, who is he? asked Yumi. The one hundred and twentieth in lineal descent from Fipora, said Mohi, and connected on the maternal side to the Lord Seigneurs of Clevonia. His uttermost uncle was nephew to the niece of Queen Smiglandi who flourished so long since she wedded at the first transit of Venus. His pedigree is endless. But who is Lord Abrasa? Has he not said? answered Babalanja. Why so dull? Uttermost nephew to him, who was nephew to the niece of the peerless Queen Smiglandi, and the one hundred and twentieth in descent from the illustrious Fipora. Will none tell who Abrasa is? Can not a man then be described by running off the catalogue of his ancestors? said Babalanja. Or must we e'en descend to himself? Then listen, dull Yumi, and know that Lord Abrasa is six feet two, plump thighs, blue eyes, and brown hair, likes his breadfruit baked, not roasted, sometimes carries filberts in his crown, and has a way of winking when he speaks. His teeth are good. Are you publishing some decamped burglar, said Medea, that you speak thus of my royal friend, the Lord Abrasa? Go on, sir, and say he reigns sole king of Bonavona. My lord, I had not ended. Abrasa, Yumi, is a fine and florid king, high-fed and affluent of heart, of speech, mellifluent, and for a royalty, extremely amiable. He is a sceptered gentleman, who does much good. Kind king. In person he gives orders for relieving those who daily dive for pearls to grace his royal robe. And gasping hard with bloodshot eyes, come up from shark-infested depths and fainting, lay their treasure at his feet. Sweet Lord Abrasa, how he pities those who, in his furthest woodlands, day-long toil to do his bidding. Yet, king philosopher, he never weeps but pities with a placid smile, and that but seldom. There seems much iron in your blood, said Medea, but say your say. Say I not truth, my lord, Abrasa I admire. 
save his royal pity all else is jocund round him he loves to live for life's own sake he vows he'll have no cares and often says in pleasant reveries sure my lord abrasa if any one should be carefree tis thou who strike down none but pity all the fallen yet none he lifteth up at length we gained the sunny side and shoreward tended vivi's horn was sonorous and issuing from his golden groves my lord abrasa like a host that greets you on the threshold met us as we keeled the beach welcome fellow demigod and king medea my pleasant guest his servitors salaamed his chieftains bowed his yeoman guard in meadow green presented palm stalks royal tokens and hand in hand the nodding jovial regal friends went up a lane of salutations dragging behind a train of envyings much we marked abrasa's jewelled crown that shot no honest blaze of ruddy rubies nor looked stern white like medea's pearls but cast a green and yellow glare rays from emeralds crossing rays from many a topaz in those beams so sinister all present looked cadaverous abrasa's cheek alone beamed bright but hectic upon its fragrant mats a spacious hall received the kings and gathering courtiers blandly bowed and gushing with soft flatteries breathed idle incense round them the hall was terraced thrice its elevated end was curtained and thence at every chime of words there burst a girl gay scarfed with naked bosom and poured forth wild and hollow laughter as she raced down all the terraces and passed their merry kingships wide round the hall in avenues waved almond woods their whiteness frosted into bloom but every vine-clad trunk was hollow-hearted hollow sounds came from the grottoes hollow broke the billows on the shore and hollow pauses filled the air following the hollow laughter guards with spears paced the groves and in the inner shadows oft were seen to lift their weapons and backward press some ugly phantom saying subjects haunt him not abrasa would be merry abrasa feasts his guests so banished from our sight seemed all things uncongenial and pleasant times were ours in these dominions not a face passed by but smiled mocking-birds perched on the boughs and singing made us vow the woods were warbling forth thanksgiving with a thousand throats the stalwart yeomen grinned beneath their trenchers heaped with citrons pomegranates grapes the pages tittered pouring out the wine and all the lords loud laughed smote their gilded spears and swore the isle was glad such the isle in which we tarried but in our rambles found no yela end of section 15 recording by james k white chula vista Section 16 of Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2, by Herman Melville. Chapters 76 through 79. Chapter 76 Some pleasant shady talk in the groves between my lords Abrasa and Medea, Babalanja, Mohi, and Yumi. Abrasa had a cool retreat, a grove of dates, where we were used to lounge of noons and mix our converse with the babble of the rills, and mix our punches in goblets chased with grapes. And as ever, King Abrasa was the prince of hosts your crown he said to medea and with his own he hung it on a bough but not ceremonious and stretched his royal legs upon the turf wine and his pages poured it out so on the grass we lounged and king abrasa who loved his antique ancestors and loved old times and would not talk of moderns 
bade Yumi sing old songs, bade Mohi rehearse old histories, bade Babalanja tell of old ontologies, and commanded all, meanwhile, to drink his old, old wine. So all round we quaffed and quoted. At last we talked of old Homeric bards, those who, ages back, harped and begged and groped their blinded way through all this charitable Marty, receiving coppers then, and immortal glory now. Abrasa. How came it that they all were blind? Babalanja. It was endemical, your highness. Few grand poets have good eyes, for they needs blind must be whoever gaze upon the sun. Vavona himself was blind when, in the silence of his secret bower, he said, I will build another world. Therein let there be kings and slaves, philosophers and wits, whose checkered actions, strange, grotesque, and merry sad, will entertain my idle moods. So, my lord, Vavona played at kings and crowns and men and manners, and loved that lonely game to play. Abrasa Vavona seemed a solitary Mardian, who seldom went abroad, had few friends, and shunning others was shunned by them. Babalanja But shun not himself, my lord, like gods, great poets dwell alone, while round them roll the worlds they build. Medea You seem to know all authors. You must have heard of Lombardo, Babalanja, he who flourished many ages since. Babalanja I have, and his grand Cortanza know by heart. Medea to Abrasa. A very curious work, that, my lord. Abrasa. Yes, my dearest king, but, Babalanja, if Lombardo had aught to tell to Marty, why choose a vehicle so crazy? Babalanja. It was his nature, I suppose. Abrasa. But so it would not have been to me. Babalanja. Nor would it have been natural for my noble lord Abrasa to have worn Lombardo's head. Every man has his own, thank Oro. Abrasa. A curious work, a very curious work. Babalanja, are you acquainted with the history of Lombardo? Babalanja. None better. All his biographies have I read. Abrasa. Then tell us how he came to write that work. For one, I cannot imagine how those poor devils contrive to roll such thunders through all Marty. Medea. Their thunder and lightning seem spontaneous combustibles, my lord. Abrasa. With which they but consume themselves, my prince beloved. Babalanja. In a measure true, your highness. But pray you listen, and I will try to tell the way in which Lombardo produced his great Cortanza. Medea. But hark, you philosopher, this time no incoherencies. Gag that devil Azaghetti. And now, what was it that originally impelled Lombardo to the undertaking? Babalanja. Primus and forever, a full heart. Brimful, bubbling, sparkling, and running over like the flagon in your hand, my lord. Secundo, the necessity of bestirring himself to procure his yams. Abrasa. Wanting the second motive, would the first have sufficed, philosopher? Babalanja. Doubtful. More conduits than one to drain off the soul's overflowings. Besides, the greatest fullness overflow not spontaneously, and even when decanted like rich syrups slowly ooze, whereas poor fluids glibly flow wide-spreading. Hence, when great fullness weds great indolence, that man to others too often proves a cipher, though to himself his thoughts form an infinite series, indefinite from its vastness, and incommunicable, not for lack of power, but for lack of an omnipotent volition to move his strength. His own world is full before him, the fulcrum set, but lever there is none. To such a man the giving of any boor's resoluteness with tendons braided would be as hanging a claymore to valor's side before unarmed. Our minds are cunning, compound mechanisms, and one spring or wheel or axle wanting, the movement lags or halts. 
Cerebrum must not overbalance cerebellum. Our brains should be round as globes, and planted on capacious chests, inhaling mighty morning inspirations. We have had vast developments of parts of men, but none of manly wholes. Before a full-developed man, Marty would fall down and worship. We are idiots, younger sons of gods, begotten in dotages divine, and our mothers all miscarry. Giants are in our germs. But we are dwarfs, staggering under heads overgrown. Heaped, our measures burst. We die of too much life. Medea to Abrasa. Be not impatient, my lord. He'll recover presently. You were talking of Lombardo, Babalanja. Babalanja. I was, your highness. Of all Mardians, by nature, he was the most inert. Hast ever seen a yellow lion all day basking in the yellow sun, in reveries rending droves of elephants, but his vast loins supine and eyelids winking? Such Lombardo. But fierce want, the hunter, came and roused his roar. In hairy billows his great mane tossed like the sea, his eyeballs flamed two hells, his paw had stopped a rolling world. Abrasa. In other words, yams were indispensable, and poor devil he roared to get them. Babalanja, bowing. Partly so, my literal lord, and as with your own golden scepter, at times upon your royal teeth, indolent tattoos you beat, then, potent, sway it o'er your isle. So, Lombardo. And ere necessity plunged spur and rowel into him, he knew not his own paces. That churned him into consciousness and brought ambition ere then dormant, seething to the top, till he trembled at himself. No mailed hand lifted up against a traveller in woods can so appall as we ourselves. We are full of ghosts and spirits. We are as graveyards, full of buried dead, that start to life before us. And all our dead sires, verily, are in us. That is their immortality. From sire to son we go on multiplying corpses in ourselves, for all of which are resurrections. Every thought's a soul of some past poet, hero, sage. We are fuller than a city. Woe it is that reveals these things. He knows himself and all that's in him, who knows adversity. To scale great heights we must come out of lowermost depths. The way to heaven is through hell. We need fiery baptisms in the fiercest flames of our own bosoms. We must feel our hearts hot, hissing in us. And ere their fire is revealed, it must burn its way out of us, though it consume us and itself. O oh, sleek-cheeked plenty, smiling at thine own dimples, vain for thee to reach out after greatness. Turn, turn from all your tears of cushions of eiderdown. Turn and be broken on the wheels of many woes. At white heat, brand thyself, and count the scars like old war-worn veterans over campfires. Soft poet, brushing tears from lilies this way, and howl in sackcloth and in ashes. Know thou that the lines that live are turned out of a furrowed brow. Oh, there is a fierce, a cannibal delight in the grief that shrieks to multiply itself. That grief is miserly of its own. It pities all the happy. Some damned spirits would not be otherwise, could they? Abrasa to Medea. Pray, my lord, is this good gentleman a devil? Medea. No, my lord, but he's possessed by one. His name is Azageti. You may hear more of him. But come, Babalanja, hast forgotten all about Lombardo? How said he about that great undertaking his Cortanza? Abrasa to Medea. Oh, for all the ravings of your Babalanja, Lombardo took no special pains, hence deserves small commendation. For genius must be somewhat like us kings, calm, content, in consciousness of power. And to Lombardo the scheme of his Cortanza must have come full-fledged, like an eagle from the sun. Babalanja. No, your highness, but like eagles his thoughts were first callow, yet born plumeless they came to soar. Abrasa. 
Very fine. I presume, Babalanja, the first thing he did was to fast and invoke the muses. Babalanja. Pardon, my lord. On the contrary, he first procured a ream of vellum and some sturdy quills, indispensable preliminaries, my worshipful lords, to the writing of the sublimest epics. Abrasa. Ah, then the muses were afterward invoked. Babalanja. Pardon again. Lombardo next sat down to a fine plantain pudding. Yumi. When the song spell steals over me, I live upon olives. Babalanja. Yumi, Lombardo eschewed olives. Said he, what fasting soldier can fight, and the fight of all fights is to write. In ten days Lombardo had written. Abrasa. Dashed off, you mean. Babalanja. He never dashed off aught. Abrasa. As you will. Babalanja. In ten days Lombardo had written full fifty folios. He loved huge acres of vellum whereon to expatiate. Medea. What then? Babalanja. He read them over attentively, made a neat package of the whole, and put it into the fire. All. How? Medea. What, these great geniuses write trash? Abrasa. I thought as much. Babalanja. My lords, they abound in it, more than any other men in Mardi. Genius is full of trash, but genius essays its best to keep it to itself and giving away its ore retains the earth, whence the too frequent wisdom of its works and folly of its life. Abrasa. Then genius is not inspired after all. How they must slave in their minds. I weep to think of it. Babalanja. My lord, all men are inspired. Fools are inspired. Your highness is inspired. For the essence of all ideas is infused. Of ourselves and in ourselves we originate nothing. When Lombardo set about his work, he knew not what it would become. He did not build himself in with plans. He wrote right on, and so doing got deeper and deeper into himself. And like a resolute traveler plunging through baffling woods, at last was rewarded for his toils. In good time, saith he, in his autobiography, I came out into a serene, sunny, ravishing region, full of sweet scents, singing birds, wild plaints, roguish laughs, prophetic voices. Here we are at last, then, he cried. I have created the creative. And now the whole boundless landscape stretched away. Lombardo panted, the sweat was on his brow. He, off mantle, braced himself sat within view of the ocean, his face to a cool rushing breeze, placed flowers before him, and gave himself plenty of room. On one side was his ream of vellum. Abrasa. And on the other, a brim beaker. Babalanja. No, your highness, though he loved it, no wine for Lombardo while actually at work. Mohi. Indeed? Why, I ever thought that it was to the superior quality of Lombardo's punches that Marty was indebted for that abounding humor of his. Babalanja. Not so. He had another way of keeping himself well braced. Yumi. Quick, tell us the secret. Babalanja. He never wrote by rushlight. His lamp swung in heaven. He rose from his east with the sun. He wrote when all nature was alive. Mohi. Doubtless, then, he always wrote with a grin, and none laughed louder at his quips than Lombardo himself. Babalanja. Hear you laughter at the birth of a man-child, old man? The babe may have many dimples, not so the parent. Lombardo was a hermit to behold. Medea. What, did Lombardo laugh with a long face? Babalanja. His merriment was not always merriment to him, your highness. For the most part, his meaning kept him serious. Then he was so intensely riveted to his work, he could not pause to laugh. Mohi. My word for it, but he had a sly one now and then. 
Babalanja. For the nonce he was not his own master, a mere amanuensis writing by dictation. Yumi. Inspiration, that. Babalanja. Call it as you will, Yumi. It was a sort of sleepwalking of the mind. Lombardo never threw down his pen. It dropped from him. And then he sat disenchanted, rubbing his eyes, staring and feeling faint, sometimes almost unto death. Medea. But pray, Babalanja, tell us how he made acquaintance with some of those rare worthies he introduces us to in his Costanza. Babalanja. He first met them in his reveries. They were walking about in him, sour and moody, and for a long time were shy of his advances. But still importune, they at last grew ashamed of their reserve, stepped forward, and gave him their hands. After that, they were frank and friendly. Lombardo set places for them at his board. When he died, he left them something in his will. Medea. What, those imaginary beings? Abrasa. Wondrous, witty, infernal fine. Medea. But Babalanja, after all, the Costanza found no favor in the eyes of some Mardians. Abrasa. Aye, the arch-critics Verbi and Batho denounced it. Babalanja. Yes. On good authority, Verbi is said to have detected a superfluous comma, and Batho declared that, with the materials, he could have constructed a far better world than Lombardo's. But didst ever hear of his laying his axis? Abrasa. But the unities. Babalanja, the unities. They are wholly wanting in the Costanza. Babalanja. Your Highness, upon that point, Lombardo was frank. Saith he in his autobiography, For some time I endeavored to keep in the good graces of those nymphs, but I found them so captious and exacting. They threw me into such a violent passion with their fault findings that at last I renounced them. Abrasa. Very rash. Babalanja. No, Your Highness. For though Lombardo abandoned all monitors from without, he retained one autocrat within, his crowned and sceptered instinct. And what, if he pulled down one gross world and ransacked the ethereal spheres to build up something of his own, a composite, what then? Matter and mind, though matching not, are mates, and sundered oft in his Costanza they unite, the airy waste embraced by stalwart arms. Medea. Incoherent again. I thought we were to have no more of this. Babalanja. My lord Medea, there are things infinite in the finite, and dualities in unities. Our eyes are pleased with the redness of the rose, but another sense lives upon its fragrance. Its redness you must approach to view. Its invisible fragrance pervades the field. So with the Costanza. Its mere beauty is restricted to its form, its expanding soul past Marty does embalm. Modak is Modaco, but Fogel Fogel is not Fogel Fee. Medea to Abrasa. My lord, you start again, but tis only another phase of Azagedi. Sometimes he's quite mad, but all this you must needs overlook. Abrasa. I will, my dear prince. What one cannot see through, one must needs look over, as you say. Yumi. But trust me, your highness, some of those strange things fall far too melodiously upon the ear to be wholly deficient in meaning. Abrasa. Your gentle minstrel, this must be, my lord. But Babalanja, the Costanza lacks cohesion. It is wild, unconnected, all episode. Babalanja. And so is Marty itself. Nothing but episodes, valleys and hills, rivers digressing from plains, vines roving all over, boulders and diamonds, flowers and thistles, forests and thickets, and here and there fens and moors. And so the world in the Costanza. Abrasa. Aye, plenty of dead desert chapters there, horrible sands to wade through. Medea. Now, Babalanja, away with your tropes, and tell us of the work directly it was done. 
What did Lombardo then? Did he show it to any one for an opinion? Babalanja. Yes, to Zinzori, who asked him where he picked up so much trash. To Honto, who bade him not be cast down, it was pretty good. To Lucre, who desired to know how much he was going to get for it. To Roddy, who offered a suggestion. Medea. And what was that? Babalanja. That he had best make a faggot of the hole and try again. Abrasa. Very encouraging. Medea. Anyone else? Babalanja. To Pollo, who, conscious his opinion was sought, was thereby puffed up, and marking the faltering of Lombardo's voice, when the manuscript was handed him, straightway concluded that the man who stood thus trembling at the bar must needs be inferior to the judge. But his verdict was mild. After sitting up all night over the work and diligently taking notes, Lombardo, my friend, here, take your sheets. I have run through them loosely. You might have done better, but then you might have done worse. Take them, my friend. I have put in some good things for you. Medea. And who was Pollo? Babalanja. Probably someone who lived in Lombardo's time, and went by that name. He is incidentally mentioned and curiously immortalized in one of the posthumous notes to the Costanza. Medea. What is said of him there? Babalanja. Not much. In a very old transcript of the work, that of Aldina, the note alludes to a brave line in the text, and runs thus. Diverting to tell, it was this passage that an old prosodist, one Pollo, claimed for his own. He maintained he made a free-will offering of it to Lombardo. Several things are yet extant of this Pollo, who died some weeks ago. He seems to have been one of those who would do great things if they could, but are content to compass the small. He imagined that the precedence of authors he had established in his library was their Marty order of merit. He condemned the sublime poems of Vavona to his lowermost shelf. Ah, thought he, how we library princes lord it over these beggarly authors. Well read in the history of their woes, Pollo pitied them all particularly the famous, and wrote little essays of his own, which he read to himself. Medea. Well, and what said Lombardo to those good friends of his, Zenzori, Hanto, and Roddy? Babalanja. Nothing. Taking home his manuscript, he glanced it over, making three corrections. Abrasa. And what then? Babalanja. Then, your highness, he thought to try a conclave of professional critics, saying to himself, Let them privately point out to me, now, all my blemishes, so that, what time they come to review me in public, all will be well. But curious to relate those professional critics, for the most part, held their peace concerning a work yet unpublished, and, with some generous exceptions in their vague, learned way, betrayed such base, beggarly notions of authorship that Lombardo could have wept had tears been his. But in his very grief he ground his teeth. Muttered he, They are fools. In their eyes, bindings, not brains, make books. They criticize my tattered cloak, not my soul, caparison like a charger. He is the great author, think they, who drives the best bargain with his wares. And no bargainer am I. Because he is old, they worship some mediocrity of an ancient, and mock at the living prophet with the live coal on his lips. They are men who would not be men had they no books. Their sires begat them not, but the authors they have read. Feelings they have none, and their very opinions they borrow. They cannot say yea nor nay without first consulting all Marty as an encyclopedia, and all the learning in them is as a dead corpse in a coffin. Were they worthy the dignity of being damned, I would damn them, but they are not. Critics? Asses. Rather, mules. So emasculated from vanity, they cannot father a true thought. Like mules, too, from dunghills, they trample down gardens of roses, and deem that crushed fragrance their own. Oh, that all round the domains of genius should lie thus unhedged, 
for such cattle to uproot. Oh, that an eagle should be stabbed by a goose quill! But at best, the greatest reviewers but prey on my leavings. For I am critic and creator, and as critic, in cruelty surpass all critics merely as a tiger jackals. For ere Marty sees aught of mine, I scrutinize it myself, remorseless as a surgeon. I cut right and left, I probe, tear, and wrench, kill, burn, and destroy. And what's left after that, the jackals are welcome to. It is I that stab false thoughts, ere hatched. I that pull down wall and tower, rejecting materials which would make palaces for others. Oh, could Marty but see how we work, it would marvel more at our primal chaos than at the round world thence emerging. It would marvel at our scaffoldings, scaling heaven, marvel at the hills of earth, banked all round our fabrics ere completed. How plain the pyramid, in this grand silence so intense, pierced by that pointed mass. Could ten thousand slaves have ever toiled? Ten thousand hammers rung? There it stands, part of Marty, claiming kin with mountains. Was this thing piecemeal built? It was. Piecemeal? Atom by atom it was laid. The world is made of mites. Yumi, musing. It is even so. Abrasa. Lombardo was severe upon the critics and they as much so upon him. Of that be sure. Babalanja. Your Highness, Lombardo never presumed to criticize true critics, who are more rare than true poets. A great critic is a sultan among satraps, but pretenders are thick as ants, striving to scale a palm after its aerial sweetness. And they fight among themselves. A saying to pluck eagles, they themselves are geese stuck full of quills, of which they rob each other. Abraza to Medea. Oro help the victim that falls in Babalanja's hands. Medea. Ah, my lord, at times his every finger is a dagger, every thought a falling tower that whelms. But resume, philosopher, what of Lombardo now? Babalanja. For this thing, said he, I have agonized over it enough. I can wait no more. It has faults all mine, its merits all its own. But I can toil no longer. The beings knit to me implore, my heart is full, my brain is sick. Let it go, let it go, and Oro with it. Somewhere Marty has a mighty heart. That struck, all the isles shall resound. Abraza. Poor devil. He took the world too hard. Medea. As most of these mortals do, my lord. That's the load, self-imposed, under which Babalanja reels. But now, philosopher, ere Marty saw it, what thought Lombardo of his work, looking at it objectively, as a thing out of him, I mean? Abrasa. No doubt, he hugged it. Babalanja. Hard to answer. Sometimes, when by himself, he thought hugely of it, as my lord Abrasa says, but when abroad among men, he almost despised it. But when he bethought him of those parts, written with full eyes, half blinded, temples throbbing, and pain at the heart. Abrasa. Poo, poo. Babalanja. He would say to himself, sure, it cannot be in vain. Yet again, when he bethought him of the hurry and bustle of Marty, dejection stole over him. Who will heed it, thought he? What care these fops and brawlers for me? But am I not myself an egregious coxcomb? Who will read me? Say one thousand pages, twenty-five lines each, every line ten words, every word ten letters. That's two million five hundred thousand A's and I's and O's to read. How many are superfluous? Am I not mad to saddle Marty with such a task? Of all men, am I the wisest to stand upon a pedestal and teach the mob? Ah, my own Cortanza, child of many prayers, in whose earnest eyes so fathomless I see my own, and recall all past delights and silent agonies thou mayest prove as the child of some fond dotard, beauteous to me, hideous to Marty and methinks that while so much slaving merits that thou shouldst not die, it has not been intense, 
prolonged enough for the high meed of immortality. Yet things immortal have been written, and by men as me, men who slept and waked and ate and talked with tongues like mine. Ah, Oro! How may we know or not we are what we would be? Hath genius any stamp and imprint obvious to possessors? Has it eyes to see itself, or is it blind? Or do we delude ourselves with being gods and end in grubs? Genius, genius, a thousand years hence to be a household word? I, Lombardo, but yesterday cut in the marketplace by a spangled fool. Lombardo immortal? Ha <laughs> ha, Lombardo. But thou art an ass, with vast ears brushing the tops of palms. Ha ha ha, methinks I see thee immortal. Thus great Lombardo saith, and thus, and thus, and thus. Thus saith he, illustrious Lombardo. Lombardo, our great countryman. Lombardo, prince of poets. Lombardo, great Lombardo. <laughs> go, go, dig thy grave and bury thyself. Abrasa. He was very funny then at times. Babalanja. Very funny, your highness. Amazing, jolly. And from my nethermost soul, would to Oro, thou couldst but feel one touch of that jolly woe. It would appall thee, my right worshipful lord Abrasa. Abrasa to Medea. My dear lord, his teeth are marvelously white and sharp. Some she-shark must have been his dam. Does he often grin thus? It was infernal. Medea. Ah, that's Asagedi. But prithee, Babalanja, proceed. Babalanja. Your highness, even in his calmer critic moods, Lombardo was far from fancying his work. He confesses that it ever seemed to him but a poor scrawled copy of something within, which, do what he would, he could not completely transfer. My canvas was small, said he. Crowded out were hosts of things that came last. But fate is in it, and fate it was, too, your highness, which forced Lombardo, ere his work was well done, to take it off his easel and send it to be multiplied. Oh, that I was not thus spurred, cried he. But like many another in its very childhood, this poor child of mine must go out into Marty and get bread for its sire. Abrasa, with a sigh. Alas, the poor devil! But methinks t'was wondrous arrogant in him to talk to all Marty at that lofty rate. Did he think himself a god? Babalanja. He himself best knew what he thought. But, like all others, he was created by Oro to some special end, doubtless partly answered in his Costanza. Medea. And now that Lombardo is long dead and gone, and his work, hooted during life, lives after him, what think the present company of it? Speak, my lord Abrasa, Babalanja, Mohi, Yumi. Abrasa, tapping his sandal with his scepter. I never read it. Babalanja looking upward. It was written with a divine intent. Mohi stroking his beard. I never hugged it in a corner and ignored it before Marty. Yumi musing. It has bettered my heart. Medea rising. And I have read it through nine times. Babalanja starting up. Ah, Lombardo, this must make thy ghost glad. Chapter 77 They Sup There seems something sinister, hollow, heartless, about Abrasa, and that green and yellow evil-starred crown that he wore. But why think of that, though we like not something in the curve of one's brow or distrust the tone of his voice, yet let us away with suspicions if we may, and make a jolly comrade of him in the name of the gods. Miserable! Thrice miserable he, who is forever turning over and over one's character in his mind, and weighing by nice of Wadupois the pros and the cons of his goodness and badness. For we are all good and bad. Give me the heart that's huge as all Asia, and unless a man be a villain outright, account him one of the best-tempered blades in the world. 
that night in his right regal hall king abrasa received us and in merry good time a fine supper was spread now in thus nocturnally regaling us our host was warranted by many ancient and illustrious examples for old jove gave suppers the god woden gave suppers the hindu deity brahma gave suppers the red man's great spirit gave suppers chiefly venison and game and many distinguished mortals besides ahasuerus gave suppers xerxes gave suppers montezuma gave suppers powhatan gave suppers the jews passovers were suppers the pharaohs gave suppers julius caesar gave suppers and rare ones they were great pompey gave suppers nabob crassus gave suppers and heliogabalus surnamed the gobbler gave suppers it was a common saying of old that king pluto gave suppers some say he is giving them still if so he is keeping tip-top company old pluto emperors and czars great moguls and great khans grand lamas and grand dukes prince regents and queen dowagers tamerlane hobnobbing with bonaparte antiochus with soliman the magnificent pisistratus pledging pilate semiramis eating bonbons with bloody mary and her namesake of medesis the thirty tyrants quaffing three to one with the council of ten and sultans satraps viziers hetmans soldans landgraves bashaws doges dauphines infantas incas and caciques looking on again at arbella the conqueror of conquerors conquering son of olympia by jupiter himself sent out cards to his captains hephaestion antigonus antipater and the rest to join him at ten p m in the temple of belus there to sit down to a victorious supper off the gold plate of the assyrian high priests how majestically he poured out his old madeira that night feeling grand and lofty as the himalays yea all babylon nodded her towers in his soul spread heaped up stacked with good things and redolent of citrons and grapes hilling round tall vases of wine and here and there waving with fresh orange boughs among whose leaves myriads of small tapers gleamed like fireflies in groves abrasa's glorious board showed like some banquet in paradise ceres and pomona presiding and jolly bacchus like a recruit with a meddlesome rifle staggering back as he fires off the bottles of vivacious champagne in ranges round about stood living candelabras lackeys gaily bedecked with tall torches in their hands and at one end stood trumpeters bugles at their lips this way my dear medea this seat at my left noble taji my right babalanja mohi where are you but where's pretty yumi gone to meditate in the moonlight ah very good let the banquet begin a blast there and charge all did the venison wild boar's meat and buffalo humps were extraordinary the wine of rare vintages like bottled lightning and the first course a brilliant affair went off like a rocket but as yet babalanja joined not in the revels his mood was on him and apart he sat silently eyeing the banquet and ever and anon muttering fogel fogel fugel fee the first fury of the feast over said king medea pouring out from a heavy flagon into his goblet abrasa these suppers are wondrous fine things ah my dear lord much better than dinners so they are so they are the dinner hour is the summer of the day full of sunshine i grant but not like the mellow autumn of supper a dinner you know may go off rather stiffly but invariably suppers are jovial at dinners tis not till you take in sail furl the cloth bow the lady passengers out and make all snug tis not till then that one begins to ride out the gale with complacency but at these suppers good oro your cup is empty my dear demigod but at these suppers i say all is snug and shipshape before you begin and when you begin you wave the beginning and begin in the middle and as for the cloth but tell us braidbeard 
what that old king of Franco, Ludwig the Fat, said of that matter. The cloth for suppers, you know. It's down in your chronicles. My lord, wiping his beard, old Ludwig was of opinion that at suppers the cloth was superfluous, unless on the back of some jolly good friar. Said he, for one, I prefer sitting right down to the unrobed table. High and royal authority that of Ludwig the Fat, said Babalanja, far higher than the authority of Ludwig the Great, the one only great by courtesy, the other fat beyond a peradventure. But they are equally famous, and in their graves both on a par. For after devouring many a fair province and grinding the poor of his realm, Ludwig the Great has long since himself been devoured by very small worms and ground into very fine dust. And after stripping many a venison rib, Ludwig the Fat has had his own polished and bleached in the valley of death. Yea, and his cranium chased with corrodings like the carved flagon once held to its jaws. My lord, my lord, cried Abrasa to Medea, this ghastly devil of yours grins worse than a skull. I feel the worms crawling over me. By Oro we must eject him. No, no, my lord, let him sit there, as of old the death's head graced the feasts of the pharaohs. Let him sit, let him sit, for death but imparts a flavor to life. Go on, wag your tongue without fear, Azageti. But come, Braidbeard, let's hear more of the Ludwigs. Well then, your highness, of all the eighteen royal Ludwigs of Franco, who, like so many tenpins all in a row, interposed Babalanja, have been bowled off the course by grim death. Heed him not, said Medea, go on. The debonair, the pious, the stammerer, the do-nothing, the juvenile, the quarreller. Of all these, I say, Ludwig the Fat was the best tableman of them all. Such a full orb paunch was his, that no way could he devise of getting to his suppers, but by getting right into them. Like the zodiac his table was circular, and full in the middle he sat like a sun all his jolly stews and ragouts revolving around him. Yea, said Babalanja, a very round son was Ludwig the Fat. No wonder he's down in the chronicles. Several L's about the waist, and king of cups and toque. Truly a famous king, three hundred weight of lard with a diadem on top, lean brains and a fat doublet, a demijohn of a demigod. Is this to be longer born? cried Abrasa, starting up. Quaff that sneer down, devil, on the instant. Down with it, to the dregs. This comes, my lord Medea, of having a slow drinker at one's board. Like an iceberg, such a fellow frosts the whole atmosphere of a banquet, and is felt a league off. We must thrust him out. Guards! Back! Touch him not, hounds! cried Medea. Your pardon, my lord, but we'll keep him to it, and melt him down in this good wine. Drink! I command it! Drink, Babalanja. And am I not drinking, my lord? Surely you would not that I should imbibe more than I can hold. The measure being full, all poured in after that is but wasted. I am for being temperate in these things, my good lord, and my one cup outlasts three of yours. Better to sip a pint than pour down a quart. All things in moderation are good, whence wine in moderation is good but all things in excess are bad, whence wine in excess is bad. Away with your logic and conic sections. Drink, but no, no, I am too severe. For of all meals a supper should be the most social and free. And going thereto we kings, my lord, should lay aside our scepters. Do as you please, Babalanja. You are right, you are right after all, my dear demigod, said Abrasa. And to say truth, I seldom worry myself with the ways of these mortals. For no thanks do we demigods get. We kings should be ever indifferent. Nothing like a cold heart. Warm ones are ever chafing and getting into trouble. I let my mortals here in this isle take heed to themselves, only barring them out when they would thrust in their petitions. This very instant, my lord, my yeoman guard is on duty without to drive off intruders. Hark! What noise is that? Ho! Who comes? At that instant, there burst into the hall a crowd of spearmen driven before a pale, ragged rout 
that loudly invoked King Abrasa. Pardon, my lord king, for thus forcing an entrance, but long in vain have we knocked at thy gates. Our grievances are more than we can bear. Give ear to our spokesman, we beseech. And from their tumultuous midst they pushed forward a tall, grim pine-tree of a fellow who loomed up out of the throng like the peak of Tenerife among the canaries in a storm. Drive the knaves out! Ho, cowards! Guards, turn about! Charge upon them! Away with your grievances! Drive them out, I say, drive them out! High times, truly, my lord Medea, when demigods are thus annoyed at their wine. Oh, who would reign over mortals? So at last, with much difficulty, the ragged rout were ejected, the peak of Tenerife going last, a pent storm on his brow, and muttering about some black time that was coming. While the hoarse murmurs without still echoed through the hall, King Abrasa, refilling his cup, thus spoke, you were saying, my dear lord, that of all meals a supper is the most social and free. Very true. And of all suppers, those given by us bachelor demigods are the best, are they not? They are. For Benedict mortals must be home betimes. Bachelor demigods are never away. Ay, your highnesses. Bachelors are all the year round at home, said Mohi, sitting out life in the chimney corner, cozy and warm as the dog while I'm turning the old-fashioned roasting jack. And to us bachelor demigods, cried Medea, our tomorrows are as long rows of fine punches ranged on a board and waiting the hand. But my good lord, said Babalanja, now brightening with wine, if of all suppers those given by bachelors be the best, of all bachelors are not your priests and monks the jolliest? I mean behind the scenes? Their prayers all said, and their futurity securely invested, who so carefree and cozy as they? Yea, a supper for two in a friar's cell in Marama is merrier far than a dinner for five and twenty in the broad right wing of Donjalolo's great palace of the morn. Bravo, Babalanja, cried Medea. Your iceberg is thawing. More of that, more of that. Did I not say we would melt him down at last, my lord? I, continued Babalanja, bachelors are a noble fraternity. I'm a bachelor myself, one of ye in that matter, my lord demigods. And if, unlike the patriarchs of the world, we father not our brigades and battalions, and send not out into the battles of our country whole regiments of our own individual raising, yet do we oftentimes leave behind us goodly houses and lands, rare old brandies and mountain malagas, and more especially warm doublets and togas and spatterdashes, wherewithal to keep comfortable those who survive us, casing the legs and arms which others beget. Then compare not invidiously Benedicts with bachelors, since thus we make an equal division of the duties which both owe to posterity. Suppers forever, cried Medea. See, my lord, what yours has done for Babalanja? He came to it a skeleton but will go away every bone padded. Ay, my lord demigod, said Babalanja, drop by drop refilling his goblet. These suppers are all very fine, very pleasant and merry, but we pay for them roundly. Everything, my good lords, has its price, from a marble to a world. And easier of digestion and better for both body and soul are a half haunch of venison and a gallon of mead taken under the sun at Meridian than the soft bridal breast of a partridge with some gentle negus at the noon of night. No lie that, said Mohi, beshrew me, in no well-appointed mansion doth the pantry lie adjoining the sleeping chamber. A good thought. I'll fill up and ponder on it. Let not Azagetti get uppermost again, Babalanja, cried Medea. Your goblet is only half full. Permit it to remain so, my lord, for whoso takes much wine to bed with him has a bedfellow more restless than a somnambulist. And though wine be a jolly blade at the board, a sulky knave is he under a blanket. I know him of old. Yet, your highness, for all this, to many a Mardian suppers are still better than dinners, at whatever cost purchased, for as much as many have more leisure to sup than dine. And though you demigods may dine at your ease, and dine it out into night, 
and sit and chirp over your burgundy till the morning larks join your crickets and wed matins to vespers, far otherwise with us plebeian mortals. From our dinners we must hie to our anvils, and the last jolly jorum evaporates in a cark and a care. Methinks he relapses, said Abrasa. It waxes late, said Mohi. Your Highnesses, is it not time to break up? No, no, cried Abrasa. Let the day break when it will, but no breakings for us. It's only midnight. This way with the wine, pass it along, my dear Medea. We are young yet, my sweet lord. Light hearts and heavy purses, short prayers and long rent rolls. Pass round the toque. We demigods have all our old age for a dormitory. Come, round and round with the flagons, let them disappear like milestones on a race course. Ah, murmured Babalanja, holding his full goblet at arm's length on the board, not thus with the hapless wight, born with a hamper on his back, and blisters in his palms. Toil and sleep, sleep and toil, are his days and his nights. He goes to bed with a lumbago, and wakes with the rheumatics. I know what it is. He snatches lunches, not dinners, and makes of all life a cold snack. Yet praise be to Oro, though to such men dinners are scarce worth the eating. Nevertheless, praise Oro again. A good supper is something. Off jackboots. Nay, off shirt, if you will, and go at it. Hurrah! The fag day is done. The last blow is an echo. Twelve long hours to sunrise and would it were an Antarctic night, and six months to tomorrow. But hurrah, the very bees have their hive, and after a day's weary wandering, high home to their honey. So they stretch out their stiff legs, rub their lame elbows, and putting their tired right arms in a sling, set the others to fetching and carrying from dishes to dentals, from foaming flagon to the demijohn which never pours out at the end you pour in. Ah, after all, the poorest devil in Marty lives not in vain. There's a soft side to the hardest oak plank in the world. Methinks I have heard some such sentimental gabble as this before from my slaves, my lord, said Abrasa to Medea. It has the old gibberish flavor. Gibberish, your highness? Gibberish? I'm full of it. I'm a gibbering ghost, my right worshipful lord. Here, pass your hand through me. Here, here, and scorch it where I most burn. By Oro, king, but I will jibe and gibber at thee, till thy crown feels like another skull clapped on thy own. Gibberish? Ay, in hell we'll gibber in concert, king. We'll howl and roast and hiss together. Devil that thou art, be gone. Ho, guard, seize him. Back, curs, cried Medea. Harm not a hair of his head. I crave pardon, King Abrasa, but no violence must be done, Babalanja. Trumpets there, said Abrasa. So the banquet is done. Lights for King Medea. Good night, my lord. Now thus for the nonce, with good cheer we close, and after many fine dinners and banquets, through light and through shade, through mirth, sorrow, and all, drawing nigh to the evening end of these wanderings wild, Meet is it that all should be regaled with a supper. Chapter 78 They Embark Next morning, King Abrasa sent frigid word to Medea that the day was very fine for yachting, but he much regretted that indisposition would prevent his making one of the party, who that morning doubtless would depart his isle. My compliments to your king, said Medea to the chamberlains, and say the royal notice to quit was duly received. Take Gazagetes also, said Babalanja, and say, I hope his highness will not fail in his appointment with me. The first midnight after he dies, at the graveyard corner, there I'll be and grin again. Sailing on, the next land we saw was thickly wooded, hedged round about by mangrove trees, which growing in the water yet lifted high their boughs. Here and there were shady nooks, half verdure and half water. Fishes rippled and canaries sung. Let us break through, my lord, said Yumi, and seek the shore. Its solitudes must prove reviving. Solitudes they are, cried Mohi. Peopled, but not enlivened, said Babalanja. Hard landing here, minstrel. 
See you not the isle is hedged? Why break through, then, said Medea? Yila is not here. I mistrusted it, sighed Yumi, an imprisoned island, full of uncomplaining woes, like many others we must have glided by, unheedingly. Yet of them have I heard, this isle many pass, marking its outward brightness, but dreaming not of the sad secrets here embowered. Haunt of the hopeless, in those inland woods brood Mardians who have tasted Mardi and found it bitter. The draught so sweet to others, maidens whose unimparted bloom has cankered in the bud, and children with eyes averted from life's dawn, like those new-oped morning blossoms which, foreseeing storms, turn and close. Yumi's rendering of the truth, said Mohi. Why land, then, said Medea? No merry man of sense, no demigod like me, will do it. Let's see all that's pleasant, or that seems so, in our circuit, and, if possible, shun the sad. Then we have circled not the round reef wholly, said Babalanja, but made of it a segment. For this is far from being the first sad land, my lord, that we have slighted at your instance. No more. I will have no gloom. A chorus. There, ye paddlers, spread all your sails. Ply paddles, breeze up, merry winds. And so, in the saffron sunset, we neared another shore. A gloomy-looking land, black, beetling crags, rent by volcanic clefts, ploughed up with watercourses and dusky with charred woods. The beach was strewn with scoria and cinders. In dolorous suffs, a chill wind blew. Wails issued from the caves, and yellow spooming surges lashed the moaning strand. Shall we land? said Babalanja. Not here, cried Yumi. No Yila here. No, said Medea. This is another of those lands far better to avoid. Know ye not, said Mohi, that here are the mines of King Clanko, whose scourged slaves, toiling in their pits, so nigh approach the volcano's bowels they hear its rumblings? Yet they must work on. Cries Clanko, the mines still yield and daily his slave's bones are brought above ground mixed with the metal masses. Set all sail there, men, away. My lord, said Babalanja, still must we shim the unmitigated evil, and only view the good, or evil so mixed therewith the mixtures both? Half veiled in misty clouds, the harvest moon now rose, and in that pale and haggard light all sat silent, each man in his own secret mood, best knowing his own thoughts. Chapter 79 Babalanja at the Full of the Moon Ho, mortals! Go we to a funeral that our paddles seem thus muffled? Up heart, Taji! Or does that witch Hautia haunt thee? Be a demigod once more and laugh. Her flowers are not barbs, and the avenger's arrows are too blunt to slay. Babalanja, Mohi, Yumi, up heart! Up heart! By Oro, I will debark the whole company on the next land we meet. No tears for me. Ha <laughs> ha! Let us laugh. Ho, Vivi, awake! Quick, boy! Some wine! And let us make glad beneath the glad moon. Look, it is stealing forth from its clouds. Perdition to Hatia. Long lives and merry ones to ourselves, Taji, my charming fellow. Here's to you. May your heart be a stone. Ha, <laughs> ha! Will nobody join me? My laugh is lonely as his who laughed in his tomb. Come, laugh. Will no one quaff wine, I say? See, the round moon is abroad. Say you so, my lord? Then for one, I am with you, cried Babalanja. Fill me a brimmer. Ah, but this wine leaps through me like a panther. Ay, let us laugh, let us roar, let us yell. What, if I was sad but just now? Life is an April day that both laughs and weeps in a breath. But whoso is wise laughs when he can. Men fly from a groan, but run to a laugh. Vivi, your gourd. My lord, let me help you. Ah, how it sparkles. Cups, cups, Vivi, more cups. Here, Taji, take that. Mohi, take that. Yumi, take that. And now let us drown away grief. Ha <laughs> ha! The house of mourning is deserted, though of old good cheer kept the funeral guests. And so keep I mine. 
Here I sit by my dead and replenish your wine cups. Old Mohi, your cup. Yumi, yours. Ha, <laughs> ha, let us laugh. Let us scream. Weeds are put off at a fair. No heart bursts but in secret. It is good to laugh, though the laugh be hollow, and wise to make merry now and for I. Laugh and make friends, weep and they go. Women sob and are rid of their grief. Men laugh and retain it. There is laughter in heaven and laughter in hell, and a deep thought whose language is laughter. Though wisdom be wedded to woe, though the way thereto is by tears, yet all ends in a shout, but wisdom wears no weeds. Woe is more merry than mirth. Tis a shallow grief that is sad. Ha, <laughs> ha, how demoniacs shout, how all skeletons grin, we all die with a rattle. Laugh, laugh, are the cherubim grave? Humor, thy laugh is divine. Whence mirth-making idiots have been revered, and therefore may I. Ho, oh, let us be gay, if it be only for an hour, and death hand us the goblet. Vivi, bring on your gourds, let us pledge each other in bumpers. Let us laugh, laugh, laugh it out to the last. All sages have laughed, let us. Bardiana laughed, let us. Democriti laughed, let us. Amori laughed, let us. Rabili roared, let us. The hyenas grin, the jackals yell, let us. But you don't laugh, my lord, laugh away. No thank you, Azagetti, not after that infernal fashion. Better weep. He makes me crawl all over as if I were an anthill, said Mohi. He's mad, 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 cried Yumi. Ay, mad, 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 mad as the mad fiend that rides me. But come, sweet minstrel, wilt list to a song? We madmen are all poets, you know. Ha, ha. Stars laugh in the sky. O oh, fugal fee, I. The waves dimple below. O oh, fugal foe. The wind strikes her dulcimers. The groves give a shout. The hurricane is only an hysterical laugh and the lightning that blasts, blasts only in play. We must laugh or we die. To laugh is to live. Not to laugh is to have the tetanus. Will you weep? Then laugh while you weep. For mirth and sorrow are kin, are published by identical nerves. Go, Yumi, go study anatomy. There is much to be learned from the dead, more than you may learn from the living, and I am dead though I live and as soon dissect myself as another. I curiously look into my secrets and grope under my ribs. I have found that the heart is not whole, but divided, that it seeks a soft cushion whereon to repose, that it vitalizes the blood, which else were weaker than water. I have found that we cannot live without hearts, though the heartless live longest. Yet hug your hearts, ye handful that have them, tis a blessed inheritance. Thus, thus, my lord, I run on. From one pole to the other, from this thing to that. But so the great world goes round, and in one Somerset shows the sun twenty-five thousand miles of a landscape. At that instant, down went the fiery full moon and the dog star, and far down into Medea, a Tivoli of wine. End of section 16. Recording by James K. White. Chula Vista. Section 17 of Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2, by Herman Melville. Chapters 80 through 84. Chapter 80. Morning. Life or death, weal or woe, the sun stays not his course. On, over battlefield and bower, over tower and town he speeds. 
peers in at births and deathbeds, lights up cathedral, mosque, and pagan shrine, laughing over all, a very democritus in the sky, and in one brief day sees more than any pilgrim in a century's round. So the sun, nearer heaven than we, with what mind then may blessed Oro downward look? It was a purple, red, and yellow east, streaked and crossed, and down from breezy mountains robust and ruddy morning came, a plaited highlander waving his plumed bonnet to the isles. Over the neighboring groves the lark soared high, and soaring sang in jubilees, while across our boughs between two isles a mighty moose swam stately as a seventy-four, and backward tossed his antlered wilderness in air. Just bounding from fresh morning groves, with the brine he mixed the dew of leaves, his antlers dripping on the swell that rippled before his brown and bow-like chest. Five hundred thousand centuries since, said Babalanja, this same sight was seen. With Oro the sun is co-eternal, and the same life that moves that moose animates alike the sun and Oro. All are parts of one. In me... In me flit thoughts participated by the beings peopling all the stars. Saturn and Mercury and Marty are brothers, one and all, and across their orbits to each other talk, like souls. Of these things what chapters might be writ? Oh, that flesh cannot keep pace with spirit. Oh, that these myriad germ dramas in me should so perish hourly for lack of power mechanic. Worlds pass worlds in space, as men, men in thoroughfares. And after periods of thousand years cry, Well met, my friend, again. To me, to me, they talk in mystic music. I hear them think through all their zones. Hail, furthest worlds, and all the beauteous beings in ye. Fan me, sweet Zenora, with thy twilight wings. Ho, let's voyage to Alderbaran. Ha, indeed, a ruddy world. What a buoyant air. Not like to Marty, this. Ruby columns, minarets of amethyst, diamond domes. Who is this? A god? What a lake-like brow, transparent as the morning air. I see his thoughts like worlds revolving, and in his eyes, like unto heavens, Soft falling stars are shooting. How these thousand passing wings winnow away my breath. I faint. Back, back to some small asteroid. Sweet being, if by Mardian word I may address thee, speak. I bear a soul in germ within me. I feel the first faint trembling, like to a harp string, vibrate in my inmost being. Kill me and generations die. So, of old, the unbegotten lived within the Virgin, who then loved her God as new-made mothers their babes ere born. O oh, Alma, 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 fangs off, fiend! Will that name ever lash thee into foam? Smite not my face so, forked flames. Babalanja, Babalanja! Rouse, man, rouse! Art in hell and damned, that thy sinews so snake-like coil and twist all over thee. Thy brow is black as ops. Turn, turn, see yonder moose. Hail, mighty brute! Thou feelest not these things. Never canst thou be damned. Moose, would thy soul were mine, for if that scorched thing mine be immortal, so thine and thy life hath not the consciousness of death. I read profound placidity, deep, million violet fathoms down, in that soft, pathetic woman eye. What is man's shrunk form to thine, thou woodland majesty? Moose, moose, my soul is shot again. O Oro, Oro! He falls, cried Medea. Mark the agony in his waning eye, said Yumi. 
Alas, poor Babalanja, is this thing of madness conscious to thyself? If ever thou art sane again, wilt thou have reminiscences? Take my robe. Here, I strip me to cover thee and all thy woes. Oro, by this, thy being's side, I kneel. Grant death or happiness to Babalanja. Chapter 81 Le Ultima Sera Thus far, through myriad islands, had we searched. Of all, no one pen may write, least mine, and still no trace of Yila. But though my hopes revived not from their ashes, yet so much of Marty had we searched, it seemed as if the long pursuit must ere many moons be ended. Whether for weal or woe, my frenzy sometimes reeked not. After its first fair morning flushings, all that day was overcast. We sailed upon an angry sea beneath an angry sky. Deep scowled on deep, and in dun vapors the blinded sun went down unseen. Though full toward the west our three prows were pointed, steadfast as three printed points upon the compass card. When we set sail from Odo, twas a glorious morn in spring, said Yumi. Toward the rising sun we steered. But now, beneath the tumnal night clouds, we hastened to its setting. How now, cried Medea, why is the minstrel mournful? He whose place it is to chase away despondency, not be its minister. Ah, my lord, so thou thinkest, but better can my verses soothe the sad than make them light of heart. Nor are we minstrels so gay of soul as Marty deems us. The brook that sings the sweetest murmurs through the loneliest woods. The isles hold thee not, thou departed. From thy bower now issues no lay. In vain we recall perished warblings. Spring birds to far climes wing their way. As Yumi thus sang, unmindful of the lay, with paddle plying, in low, pleasant tones, thus hummed to himself our bowsman, a gamesome wight. Ho, merrily ho, we paddlers sail. Ho, over sea dingle and dale. Our pulses fly, our hearts beat high. Ho, merrily, merrily ho. But a sudden splash and a shrill, gurgling sound, like that of a fountain subsiding, now broke upon the air. Then all was still, save the rush of the waves by our keels. Save him! Put back! From his elevated seat the merry bowsman, too gleefully reaching forward, had fallen into the lagoon. With all haste our speeding canoes were reversed but not till we had darted in upon another darkness than that in which the bowsman fell. As blindly we groped back, deep night dived deeper down in the sea. Drop paddles all, and list. Holding their breath, over the six gunwales all now leaned, but the only moans were the winds. Long time we lay thus, then slowly crossed and recrossed our track, almost hopeless but yet loath to leave him who, with a song in his mouth, died and was buried in a breath. Let us away, said Medea. Why seek more? He is gone. Ay, gone, said Babalanja, and whither? But a moment since he was among us. Now the fixed stars are not more remote than he. So far off can he live? O oh, Oro, this death thou ordainest unmans the manliest. Say not nay, my lord, let us not speak behind death's back. Hard and horrible is it to die, blindfold to leap from life's verge. But thus, in clouds of dust, and with a trampling as of hoofs, the generations disappear, death driving them all into his treacherous fold, as wild Indians the bison herds. Nay, Nay, death is life's last despair. Hard and horrible is it to die. Otto himself, in Alma, died not without a groan. Yet why? Why live? Life is wearisome to all. The same dull round. Day and night, summer and winter, 
round about us revolving for aye. One moment lived is a life. No new stars appear in the sky, no new lights in the soul. Yet of changes there are many. For though with rapt sight in childhood we behold many strange things beneath the moon, and all Marty looks attended fair, how soon everything fades. All of us in our very bodies outlive our own selves. I think of green youth as of a merry playmate departed and to shake hands and be pleasant with my old age seems in prospect even harder than to draw a cold stranger to my bosom. But old age is not for me. I am not of the stuff that grows old. This Marty is not our home. Up and down we wander like exiles transported to a planet afar. Tis not the world we were born in, not the world once so lightsome and gay, not the world where we once merrily danced, dined, and supped, and wooed and wedded our long-buried wives. Then let us depart, but whither? We push ourselves forward, then, start back in a fright. Essay it again and flee. Hard to live, hard to die, intolerable suspense. But the grim despot at last interposes, and with a viper in our winding sheets, we are dropped in the sea. To me, said Mohi, his gray locks damp with night dews, death's dark defile at times seems at hand with no voice to cheer. That all have died makes it not easier for me to depart, and that many have been quenched in infancy seems a mercy to the slow perishing of my old age, limb by limb and sense by sense. I have long been the tomb of my youth, and more has died out of me, already, than remains for the last death to finish. Babalanja says truth. In childhood, death stirred me not. In middle age, it pursued me like a prowling bandit on the road. Now, grown an old man, it boldly leads the way, and ushers me on, and turns round upon me its skeleton gaze, poisoning the last solaces of life. Marama but adds to my gloom. Death, death, cried Yumi, must I be not and millions be? Must I go and the flowers still bloom? Oh, I have marked what it is to be dead. How shouting boys of holidays hide and seek among the tombs, which must hide all seekers at last. Clouds on clouds, cried Medea, but away with them all. Why not leap your graves while ye may? Time to die when death comes, without dying by inches. Tis no death to die. The only death is the fear of it. I, a demigod, fear death not. But when the jackals howl round you, said Babalanja, drive them off, die the demigod's death. On his last couch of cross spears, my brave old sire cried, Wine, wine, strike up, conch and cymbal. Let the king die to martial melodies. More valiant dying than dead, said Babalanja. Our end of the winding procession resounds with music and flaunts with banners with brave devices. Cheer up, fear not, millions have died before. But in the endless van, not a pennon streams. All there is silent and solemn. The last wisdom is dumb. Silence ensued, during which each dip of the paddles in the now calm water fell full and long upon the ear. Anon, lifting his head, Babalanja thus, Yila still eludes us, and in all this tour of Marty how little have we found to fill the heart with peace, how much to slaughter all our yearnings. Croak no more, raven, cried Medea. Marty is full of springtime sights and jubilee sounds. I never was sad in my life. But for thy one laugh, my lord, how many groans! Were all happy or all miserable, more tolerable then than as it is. But happiness and misery are so broadly marked that this Marty may be the retributive future of some forgotten past, yet vain our surmises. Still vainer to say that all Marty is but a means to an end, that this life is a state of probation 
that evil is but permitted for a term, that for specified ages a rebel angel is viceroy. Nay, nay, Otto delegates his scepter to none. In his everlasting reign there are no interregnums, and time is eternity, and we live in eternity now. Yet some tell of a hereafter, where all the mysteries of life will be over, and the sufferings of the virtuous recompensed. Otto is just, they say. Then always, now and evermore. But to make restitution implies a wrong, and Otto can do no wrong. Yet what seems evil to us may be good to him. If he fears not, nor hopes, he has no other passion, no ends, no purposes. He lives content. All ends are compassed in him. He has no past, no future. He is the everlasting now, which is an everlasting calm, and things that are, have been, will be. This glooms enough, but hoot, hoot, the night owl ranges through the woodlands of Marama. Its dismal notes pervade our lives, and when we would fain depart in peace, that bird flies on before, cloud-like, eclipsing our setting suns and filling the air with dolor. Too true, cried Yumi, our calms must come by storms. Like helmless vessels, tempest-tossed, our only anchorage is when we founder. Our beginnings, murmured Mohi, are lost in clouds. We live in darkness all our days and perish without an end. Croak on, cowards, cried Medea, and fly before the hideous phantoms that pursue ye. No coward he, who hunted, turns and finds no foe to fight, said Babalanja. Like the stag whose brow is beat with wings of hawks, perched in his heavenward antlers, so I, blinded, goaded, headlong rush, this way and that, nor knowing whither, one forest wide around. Chapter 82 They Sail from Night to Day Ere long the three canoes lurched heavily in a violent swell. Like palls, the clouds swept to and fro, hooding the gibbering winds. At every headbeat wave, our arching prows reared up and shuddered. The night ran out in rain. Whither to turn we knew not, nor what haven to gain, so dense the darkness. But at last the storm was over. Our shattered prows seemed gilded. Day dawned, and from his golden vases poured red wine upon the waters. That flushed tide rippled toward us, floating from the east a lone canoe, in which there sat a mild old man, a palm bough in his hand, a bird's beak holding amaranth and myrtles, his slender prow. Alma's blessing upon ye, voyagers, ye look storm-worn. The storm we have survived, old man, and many more we yet must ride, said Babalanja. The sun is risen, and all is well again. We but need to repair our prows, said Medea. Then turn aside to Serenia, a pleasant isle, where all are welcome, where many storm-worn rovers land at last to dwell. Serenia, said Babalanja. Methinks Serenia is that land of enthusiasts of which we hear, my lord where Mardians pretend to the unnatural conjunction of reason with things revealed, where Alma, they say, is restored to his divine original, where, deriving their principles from the same sources whence flow the persecutions of Marama, men strive to live together in gentle bonds of peace and charity. Folly! Folly! Ay, said Medea, much is said of those people of Serenia, but their social fabric must soon fall to pieces. It is based upon the idlest of theories. Thanks for thy courtesy, old man, but we care not to visit thy isle. Our voyage has an object, which, something tells me, will not be gained by touching at thy shores. Elsewhere we may refit. Farewell. Tis breezing. Set the sails. Farewell, old man. Nay, nay, think again. The distance is but small, the wind fair, but tis ever so thither. Come, we people of Serenia 
are most anxious to be seen of Marty, so that if our manner of life seem good, all Marty may live as we. In blessed Alma's name I pray ye come. Shall we then, my lord? Lead on, old man. We will e'en see this wondrous isle. So, guided by the venerable stranger, by noon we descried an island blooming with bright savannas and pensive with peaceful groves. Wafted from this shore came balm of flowers and melody of birds, a thousand summer sounds and odors. The dimpled tide sang round our splintered prows, the sun was high in heaven, and the waters were deep below. The land of love! the old man murmured as we neared the beach, where innumerable shells were gently rolling in the playful surf and murmuring from their tuneful valves. Behind, another and a verdant surf played against lofty banks of leaves, where the breeze likewise found its shore. And now, emerging from beneath the trees, there came a goodly multitude in flowing robes, palm branches in their hands, and as they came they sang, Hail, voyagers, hail! Whence e'er ye come, where'er ye rove! No calmer strand, no sweeter land, Will e'er ye view than the land of love. Hail, voyagers, hail! To these our shores soft gales invite. The palm plumes wave, the billows lave, And hither point fixed stars of light. Hail, voyagers, hail! Think not our groves wide brood with gloom. In this our isle bright flowers smile, Full urns rose-heaped these valleys bloom. Hail, voyagers, hail, be not deceived, Renounce vain things, ye may not find a tranquil mind, Though hence ye sail with swiftest wings. Hail, voyagers, hail, time flies full fast, Life soon is o'er and ye may mourn that hither born ye left behind our pleasant shore. Chapter 83 They Land The song was ended, and as we gained the strand, the crowd embraced us, and called us brothers, ourselves and our humblest attendants. Call ye us brothers, whom e'er now ye never saw? Even so, said the old man, is not Oro the father of all? Then are we not brothers? Thus Alma, the master, hath commanded. This was not our reception in Marama, said Medea, the appointed place of Alma, where his precepts are preserved. No, no, said Babalanja. Old man, your lesson of brotherhood was learned elsewhere than from Alma, for in Marama and in all its tributary isles true brotherhood there is none. Even in the holy island many are oppressed, for heresies many murdered, and thousands perish beneath the altars, groaning with offerings that might relieve them. Alas, too true! But I beseech ye, judge not Alma by all those who profess his faith. Hast thou thyself his record searched? Fully I have not. So long even from my infancy have I witnessed the wrongs committed in his name the sins and inconsistencies of his followers, that thinking all evil must flow from a congenial fountain, I have scorned to study the whole record of your master's life. By parts I only know it. Ah, baneful error! But thus is it, brothers, that the wisest are set against the truth, because of those who wrested from itself. Do ye then claim to live what your master hath spoken? Are your precepts practices? Nothing do we claim, we but earnestly endeavor. Tell me not of your endeavors, but of your life. What hope for the fatherless among ye? Adopted as a son, of one poor and naked? Clothed, and he wants for naught. If ungrateful he smite you? Still we feed and clothe him. If yet an ingrate? Long he cannot be, for love is a fervent fire. But what, if widely he dissent from your belief in Alma, then surely ye must cast him forth. No, no, we will remember that if he dissent from us, we then equally dissent from him, and men's faculties are oro-given. 
nor will we say that he is wrong and we are right. For this we know not, absolutely. But we care not for men's words. We look for creeds and actions, which are the truthful symbols of the things within. He who hourly prays to Alma, but lives not up to worldwide love and charity, that man is more an unbeliever than he who verbally rejects the master, but does his bidding. Our lives are our amens. But some say that what your Alma teaches is wholly new, a revelation of things before unimagined, even by the poets. To do his bidding, then, some new faculty must be vouchsafed, whereby to apprehend aright. So have I always thought, said Mohi. If Alma teaches love, I want no gift to learn, said Yumi. All that is vital in the master's faith lived here in Marty, and in humble dells was practiced, long previous to the master's coming. But never before was virtue so lifted up among us that all might see. Never before did rays from heaven descend to glorify it. But are truth, justice, and love the revelations of Alma alone? Were they never heard of till he came? Oh, Alma but opens unto us our own hearts. Were his precepts strange, we would recoil, not one feeling would respond. Whereas, once hearkened to, our souls embrace them as with the instinctive tendrils of a vine. But, said Babalanja, since Alma, they say, was solely intent upon the things of the Marty to come, which to all must seem uncertain, of what benefit his precepts for the daily lives led here? Would, would that Alma might once more descend. Brother, were the turf our everlasting pillow, still would the master's faith answer a blessed end, making us more truly happy here. That is the first and chief result. For holy here we must be holy elsewhere. Tis Marty to which loved Alma gives his laws, not paradise. Full soon will I be testing all these things, murmured Mohi. Old man, said Medea, thy years and Mohi's lead ye both to dwell upon the unknown future. But speak to me of other themes. Tell me of this island and its people. From all I have heard and now behold, I gather that here there dwells no king, that ye are left to yourselves, and that this mystic love ye speak of is your ruler. Is it so? Then are ye full as visionary as Marty rumors? And though for a time ye may have prospered, long ye cannot be without some sharp lesson to convince ye that your faith in Martian virtue is entirely vain. Truth, we have no king, for Alma's precepts rebuke the arrogance of place and power. He is the tribune of mankind, nor will his true faith be universal Marty's till our whole race is kingless. But think not we believe in man's perfection. Yet against all good he is not absolutely set. In his heart there is a germ. That we seek to foster. To that we cling, else all were hopeless. Your social state? It is imperfect, and long must so remain. But we make not the miserable many support the happy few, nor by annulling reason's laws seek to breed equality by breeding anarchy. In all things equality is not for all. Each has his own. Some have wider groves of palms than others. Fare better. Dwell in more tasteful arbors. Oftener renew their fragrant thatch. Such differences must be but none starve outright while others feast. By the abounding, the needy are supplied, yet not by statute, but from dictates born half dormant in us and warmed into life by Alma. Those dictates we but follow in all we do. We are not dragged to righteousness, but go running. Nor do we live in common, for vice and virtue blindly mingled form a union where vice too often proves the alkali. The vicious we make dwell apart, until reclaimed. And reclaimed they soon must be, since everything invites. The sin of others rests not upon our heads, none we drive to crime. 
Our laws are not a vengeance bred, but love and alma. Fine poetry all this, said Babalanja, but not so new. Oft do they warble thus in bland marama. It sounds famously, old man, said Medea, but men are men. Some must starve, some be scourged. Your doctrines are impracticable. And are not these things enjoined by Alma? And would Alma inculcate the impossible? Of what merit his precepts, unless they may be practiced? But I beseech ye, speak no more of Marama. Alas, did Alma revisit Marty, think you, it would be among those morals he would lay his head. No, no, said Babalanja, as an intruder he came, and an intruder would he be this day. On all sides would he jar our social systems. Not here, not here. Rather would we welcome Alma hungry and athirst than though he came floating hither on the wings of seraphs, the blazing zodiac his diadem. In all his aspects we adore him, needing no pomp and power to kindle worship. Though he came from Oro, though he did miracles, though through him is life, not for these things alone do we thus love him. We love him from an instinct in us, a fond, filial, reverential feeling. And this would yet stir in our souls were death our end, and Alma incapable of befriending us. We love him because we do. Is this man divine? murmured Babalanja. But thou speakest most earnestly of adoring Alma. I see no temples in your groves. Because this isle is all one temple to his praise, every leaf is consecrated his. We fix not Alma here and there, and say, Those groves for him, and these broad fields for us. It is all his own, and we ourselves, our every hour of life, and all we are and have. Then ye forever fast and pray, and stand and sing, as at long intervals the censor-bearers and Marama supplicate their gods. Alma forbid, we never fast. Our aspirations are our prayers, our lives are worship. And when we laugh with human joy at human things, then do we most sound great Oro's praise, and prove the merit of sweet Alma's love. Our love in Alma makes us glad, not sad. Ye speak of temples. Behold, tis by not building them that we widen charity among us. The treasures which in the islands round about are lavished on a thousand fanes. With these we every day relieve the master's suffering disciples. In Marty, Alma preached in open fields. And must his worshippers have palaces? No temples, then no priests, said Babalanja, for few priests will enter where lordly arches form not the portal. We have no priests but one, and he is Alma's self. We have his precepts. We seek no comments but our hearts. But without priests and temples, how long will flourish this your faith? said Medea. For many ages has not this faith lived in spite of priests and temples? And shall it not survive them? What we believe we hold divine, and things divine endure forever. But how enlarge your bounds? How convert the vicious without persuasion of some special seers? Must your religion go hand in hand with all things secular? We hold not that one man's words should be a gospel to the rest, but that Alma's words should be a gospel to us all. And not by precepts would we have some few endeavor to persuade, but all, by practice, fix convictions that the life we lead is the life for all. We are apostles, every one. Where'er we go, our faith we carry in our hands and hearts. It is our chiefest joy. We do not put it wide away six days out of seven, and then assume it. In it we all exult in joy as that which makes us happy here, as that without which we could be happy nowhere, as something meant for this time present, and henceforth for I. It is our vital mode of being, not an incident, and when we die, this faith shall be our pillow, and when we rise, 
our staff, and at the end our crown. For we are all immortal. Here Alma joins with our own hearts, confirming nature's promptings. How eloquent is he, murmured Babalanja. Some black cloud seems floating from me. I begin to see. I come out in light. The sharp fang tears me less. The forked flames wane. My soul sets back like ocean streams that sudden change their flow. Have I been sane? Quickened in me is a hope. But pray you, old man, say on. Methinks that in your faith must be much that jars with reason. No, brother. Right reason and Alma are the same. Else Alma, not reason, would we reject. The master's great command is love, and here do all things wise and all things good unite. Love is all in all. The more we love, the more we know. And so reversed. Oro we love. This isle and our wide arms embrace all Marty like its reef. How can we err thus feeling? We hear loved Alma's pleading, prompting voice in every breeze, in every leaf. We see his earnest eye in every star and flower. Poetry, cried Yumi, and poetry is truth. He stirs me. When Alma dwelt in Marty, t'was with the poor and friendless. He fed the famishing, he healed the sick, he bound up wounds. For every precept that he spoke, he did ten thousand mercies. And Alma is our loved example. Sure, all this is in the histories, said Mohi, starting. But not alone to poor and friendless did Alma wend his charitable way. From lowly places he looked up, and long invoked great chieftains in their state, and told them all their pride was vanity, and bade them ask their souls. In me, he cried, is that heart of mild content, which in vain ye seek in rank and title. I am love. Love ye, then me. Cease, cease, old man, cried Medea. Thou movest me beyond my seeming. What thoughts are these? Have done. Wouldst thou unking me? Alma is for all, for high and low. Like heaven's own breeze, he lifts the lily from its lowly stem, and sweeps, reviving, through the palmy groves. High thoughts he gives the sage, and humble trust the simple. Be the measure what it may, his grace doth fill it to the brim. He lays the lashings of the soul's wild aspirations after things unseen. Oil he poureth on the waters, and stars come out of night's black concave at his great command. In him is hope for all, for all unbounded joys. Fast locked in his loved clasp, no doubts dismay. He opes the eye of faith and shuts the eye of fear. He is all we pray for and beyond. All that in the wildest hour of ecstasy wrapped fancy paints in bright auroras upon the soul's wide boundless orient. O oh, Alma, Alma, Prince Divine! cried Babalanja, sinking on his knees. In thee, at last, I find repose. Hope perches in my heart a dove, a thousand rays illume, all heaven's a sun. Gone, gone are all distracting doubts. Love and Alma now prevail. I see with other eyes. Are these my hands? What wild, wild dreams were mine? I have been mad. Some things there are we must not think of. Beyond one obvious mark, all human lore is vain. Where have I lived till now? Had Dark Marama's zealot tribe but murmured to me as this old man, long since had I been wise. Reason no longer domineers, but still doth speak. All I have said ere this, that wars with Alma's precepts, I here recant. Here I kneel, and own great Oro and his sovereign son. And here another kneels and prays, cried Yumi. In Alma, all my dreams are found, my inner longings for the love supreme that prompts my every verse. Summer is in my soul. Nor now too late for these gray hairs, cried Mohi with devotion. Alma, thy breath is on my soul, 
I see bright light. No more a demigod, cried Medea, but a subject to our common chief. No more shall dismal cries be heard from Oro's groves. Alma, I am thine. With swimming eyes, the old man kneeled, and round him grouped king, sage, gray hairs, and youth. There, as they kneeled, and as the old man blessed them, the setting sun burst forth from mists, gilded the island round about, shed rays upon their heads, and went down in a glory. All the east radiant with red burnings, like an altar fire. Chapter 84 Babalanja Relates to Them a Vision Leaving Babalanja in the old man's bower, deep in meditation, Thoughtfully we strolled along the beach, inspiring the musky midnight air, the tropical stars glistening in heaven like drops of dew among violets. The waves were phosphorescent, and laved the beach with a fire that cooled it. Returning, we espied Babalanja advancing in his snow-white mantle. The fiery tide was ebbing, and in the soft, moist sand, at every step, he left a lustrous footprint. Sweet friends, this isle is full of mysteries, he said. I have dreamed of wondrous things. After I had laid me down, thought pressed hard upon me. By my eyes passed pageant visions. I started at a low, strange melody, deep in my inmost soul. At last, methought my eyes were fixed on heaven, and there I saw a shining spot, unlike a star. Thwarting the sky, it grew and grew, descending till bright wings were visible, between them a pensive face angelic, downward beaming, and for one golden moment gauze veiled in spangled Bernice's locks. Then, as white flame from yellow, out from that starry cluster it emerged, and brushed the astral crosses, crowns, and cups. And as in violet tropic seas, ships leave a radiant white and firefly wake, so, in long extension tapering behind the vision, gleamed another milky way. Strange throbbing seized me, my soul tossed on its own tides. But soon the inward harmony bounded in exulting choral strains. I heard a feathery rush, and straight beheld a form traced all over with veins of vivid light. The vision undulated round me. O oh, spirit, angel, God! Whate'er thou art, I cried, leave me, I am but man. Then I heard a low, sad sound, no voice, it said, or breathed upon me. Thou hast proved the grace of Alma, tell me what thou'st learned. Silent replied my soul, for voice was gone. This have I learned, O spirit, in things mysterious to seek no more, but rest content with knowing naught but love. Blessed art thou for that, thrice blessed, then I heard, and since humility is thine, thou art one apt to learn. That which thy own wisdom could not find, thy ignorance confessed shall gain. Come, and see new things. Once more it undulated round me, its lightning wings grew dim, nearer, nearer, till I felt a shock electric and nested neath its wing. We clove the air, past systems, suns, and moons, what seemed from Marty's isles the glow-worm stars. By distant fleets of worlds we sped as voyagers pass far sails at sea, and hailed them not. Foam played before them as they darted on. Wild music was their wake, and many tracks of sound we crossed, where worlds had sailed before. Soon we gained a point where a new heaven was seen, whence all our firmament seemed one nebula, its glories burned like thousand steadfast flaming lights. Here hived the worlds in swarms, and gave forth sweets ineffable. We lighted on a ring, circling a space where morning seemed forever dawning over worlds unlike. Here, I heard, thou viewest thy Marty's heaven. Herein each world is portioned. As he who climbs to mountain tops pants hard for breath, so panted I for Marty's grosser air. But that which caused my flesh to faint was new vitality to my soul. 
My eyes swept over all before me. The spheres were plain as villages that dot a landscape. I saw most beauteous forms, yet like our own. Strange sounds I heard of gladness that seemed mixed with sadness. A low, sweet harmony of both. Else, I know not how to phrase what never man but me e'er heard. In these blessed souls are blent, my guide discoursed, far higher thoughts and sweeter plaints than thine. Rude joy were discord here, and as a sudden shout in thy hushed mountain passes brings down the awful avalanche, so one note of laughter here might start some white and silent world. Then low I murmured, Is theirs, O guide, no happiness supreme? Their state still mixed? Sigh these yet to know? Can these sin? Then I heard, No mind but Oro's can know all. No mind that knows not all can be content. Content alone approximates to happiness. Holiness comes by wisdom, and it is because great Oro is supremely wise that he's supremely holy. But as perfect wisdom can be only Oro's, so perfect holiness is his alone. And whoso is otherwise than perfect in his holiness is liable to sin. And though death gave these beings knowledge, it also opened other mysteries which they pant to know, and yet may learn. And still they fear the thing of evil, though for them tis hard to fall. Thus hoping and thus fearing, then, theirs is no state complete. And since Odo is past finding out, and mysteries ever open into mysteries beyond, so, though these beings will for aye progress in wisdom and in good, yet will they never gain a fixed beatitude. Know, then, O mortal Mardian, that when translated hither, thou wilt but put off lowly temporal pinings for angel and eternal aspirations. Start not, thy human joy hath here no place, no name. Still, I mournful mused, then said, Many Mardians live who have no aptitude for Mardian lives of thought. How then endure more earnest, everlasting meditations? Such have their place, I heard. Then low I moaned. And what, O oh guide, of those who, living thoughtless lives of sin, die unregenerate, no service done to Oro or to Mardian? They too have their place, I heard. But tis not here. And Mardian, know that as your Mardian lives are long preserved through strict obedience to the organic law, so are your spiritual lives prolonged by fast keeping of the law of mind. Sin is death. Ah, then, yet lower moan made I. And why create the germs that sin and suffer, but to perish? That, breathe my guide, is the last mystery which underlieth all the rest. Archangel may not fathom it, that makes of Oro the everlasting mystery he is, that to divulge were to make equal to himself in knowledge all the souls that are, that mystery Oro guards, and none but him may know. Alas, were it recalled, no words have I to tell of all that now my guide discoursed concerning things unsearchable to us. My sixth sense, which he opened, sleeps again, with all the wisdom that it gained. Time passed. It seemed a moment, might have been an age, when from high in the golden haze that canopied this heaven, another angel came, its vans like east and west, a sunrise one, sunset the other. As silver fish in vases, so in his azure eyes swam tears unshed. Quick, my guide close nested me. Through its veins, the waning light throbbed hard. O oh, spirit, archangel, God, whate'er thou art, it breathed. Leave me, I am but blessed, not glorified. So saying, as down from doves, from its wings dropped sounds, still nesting me, it crouched its plumes. Then, in a snow of softest syllables, thus breathed the greater and more beautiful. From far away in fields beyond thy ken, I heard thy fond discourse with this lone Mardian. It pleased me well, for thy humility was manifest, no arrogance of knowing. Come thou, and learn new things. And straight, 
it overarched us with its plumes, which then, down-sweeping, bore us up to regions where my first guide had sunk, but for the power that buoyed us, trembling, both. My eyes did wane, like moons eclipsed in overwhelming dawns. Such radiance was around, such vermeil light, born of no sun, but pervading all the scene. Transparent, fleckless, calm, all glowed one flame. Then said the greater guide, This is the night of all ye here behold, its day ye could not bide. Your utmost heaven is far below. Abashed, smote down, I, quaking, upward gazed, where, to and fro, the spirits sailed, like broad-winged, crimson-dyed flamingos, spiraling in sunset clouds. But a sadness glorified, deep-fringed their mystic temples, crowned with weeping halos, bird-like, floating o'er them, wheresoe'er they roamed. Sights and odors blended, as when new morning winds in summer's prime blow down from hanging gardens, wafting sweets that never pall. So from those flowery pinions at every motion came a flood of fragrance. And now the spirits twain discoursed of things whose very terms to me were dark. But my first guide grew wise. For me I could but blankly list, yet comprehended naught. And like the fish that's mocked with wings and vainly seeks to fly, again I sought my lower element. As poised, we hung in this rapt ether, a sudden trembling seized the four wings now folding me. And afar off, in zones still upward reaching, sun's orbits off, I, tranced, beheld an awful glory. Sphere and sphere it burned. The one Shekinah. The air was flaked with fire, deep in which fell showers of silvery globes, tears magnified, braiding the flame with rainbows. I heard a sound, but not for me, nor my first guide, was that unutterable utterance. Then my second guide was swept aloft, as rises a cloud of red-dyed leaves in autumn whirlwinds. Fast clasping me, the other drooped, and, instant, sank, as in a vacuum, myriad suns' diameters in a breath. My five senses merged in one of falling, till we gain the nether sky, descending still. Then strange things, soft, sad, and faint, I saw or heard, as when, in sunny summer seas, down, down, you dive, starting at pensive phantoms that you cannot fix. These, breathed my guide, are spirits in their essences, sad, even in undevelopment. With these all space is peopled. All the air is vital with intelligence, which seeks embodiment. This it is that, unbeknown to Mardians, causes them to strangely start in solitudes of night and in the fixed flood of their enchanted noons. From hence are formed your mortal souls. And all those sad and shadowy dreams and boundless thoughts man hath are vague remembrances of the time when the soul's sad germ wide wandered through these realms. And hence it is that when ye Mardians feel most sad, then ye feel most immortal. Like a spark new struck from flint, soon Marty showed afar. It glowed within a sphere which seemed, in space, a bubble rising from vast depths to the sea's surface. Piercing it, my Mardian strength returned, but the angel's veins once more grew dim. Nearing the isles, thus breathed my guide, Loved one, love on, but know that heaven hath no roof. To know all is to be all. Beatitude there is none, and your only Mardian happiness is but exemption from great woes. No more. Great love is sad, and heaven is love. Sadness makes the silence throughout the realms of space. Sadness is universal and eternal. But sadness is tranquility, tranquility the uttermost that souls may hope for. Then with its wings it fanned adieu, and disappeared where the sun flames highest. We heard the dream, and, silent, 
sought repose to dream away our wonder. End of section 17. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 18 of Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2, by Herman Melville. Chapters 85 through 87. Chapter 85. They Depart from Serenia. At sunrise we stood upon the beach. Babalanja thus. My voyage is ended, not because what we sought is found, but that I now possess all which may be had of what I sought in Marty. Here tarry to grow wiser still. Then I am Alma's and the world's. Taji, for Yila thou wilt hunt in vain. She is a phantom that but mocks thee, and while for her thou madly huntest, the sin thou didst cries out, and its avenger still will follow. But here they may not come, nor those who, tempting, track thy path. Wise counsel take. Within our hearts is all we seek, though in that search many need a prompter. Him I have found in blessed Alma. Then rove no more. Gain now, in flush of youth, that last wise thought, too often purchased by a life of woe. Be wise, be wise. Medea, thy station calls thee home. Yet from this isle thou earnest that, wherewith to bless thy own. These flowers that round us spring may be transplanted, and Odo made to bloom with amaranths and myrtles, like this Serenia. Before thy people act the things thou here hast heard, let no man weep, that thou mayest laugh, no man toil too hard, that thou mayest idle be. Abdicate thy throne, but still retain the scepter. None need a king, but many need a ruler. Mohi, Yumi, do we part? Then bury in forgetfulness much that hitherto I've spoken. But let not one syllable of this old man's words be lost. Mohi, age leads thee by the hand. Live out thy life and die calm-browed. But Yumi, many days are thine, and in one life's span great circles may be traversed, eternal good be done. Take all Marty for thy home. Nations are but names, and continents but shifting sands. Once more, Taji, be sure thy Yila never will be found, or found will not avail thee. Yet search, if so thou wilt, more isles thou sayest are still unvisited, and when all is seen, return and find thy Yila here. Companions all, adieu. And from the beach he wended through the woods. Our shallops now refitted, we silently embarked and as we sailed away the old man blessed us. For a time each prow's ripplings were distinctly heard, ripple after ripple. With silent steadfast eyes, Medea still preserved his noble mien, Mohi his reverend repose, Yumi his musing mood. But as a summer hurricane leaves all nature still and smiling to the eye, yet in deep woods there lie concealed some anguished roots torn up, so with these. Much they longed to point our prows for Odo's isle, saying our search was over, but I was fixed as fate. On we sailed as when we first embarked, the air was bracing as before. More isles we visited, thrice encountered the Avengers, but unharmed. Thrice Hatya's heralds but turned not aside saw many checkered scenes, wandered through groves and open fields, traversed many vales, climbed hilltops whence broad views were gained, tarried in towns, broke into solitudes, sought far, sought near, 
Still Yila, there was none. Then again they all would fain dissuade me. Closed is the deep blue eye, said Yumi. Fate's last leaves are turning. Let me home and die, said Mohi. So nigh the circuit's done, said Medea. Our morrow's sun must rise o'er Odo. Taji, renounce the hunt. I am the hunter that never rests, the hunter without a home. She, I seek, still flies before, and I will follow, though she lead me beyond the reef, through sunless seas, and into night and death. Her will I seek, through all the isles and stars, and find her whate'er betide. Again they yielded, and again we glided on. Our storm-worn prows now pointed here, now there, beckoned, repulsed, their half-rent sails still courting every breeze. But that same night, once more, they wrestled with me. Now at last the hopeless search must be renounced. Yila, there was none. Back must I hie to blue Serenia. Then sweet Yila called me from the sea. Still must I on, but gazing whence that music seemed to come, I thought I saw the green course drifting by, and striking against our prow as if to hinder. Then, then, my heart grew hard, like flint, and black like night, and sounded hollow to the hand I clenched. Hyenas filled me with their laughs. Death damps chilled my brow. I prayed not, but blasphemed. CHAPTER 86 THEY MEET THE PHANTOMS That starless midnight there stole from out the darkness the iris flag of Hautia. Again the sirens came. They bore a large and stately urn-like flower, white as alabaster, and glowing as if lit up within. From its calyx, flame-like, trembled forked and crimson stamens, burning with intensest odors. The phantoms nearer came their flower as an urn of burning nitre. Then it changed and glowed like Persian dawns, or passive was shot over by palest lightnings, so variable its tints. The night blowing serious, said Yumi shuddering, that never blows in sunlight, that blows but once, and blows but for an hour. For the last time I come, now in your midnight of despair, and promise you this glory. Take heed, Short time hast thou to pause. Through me, perhaps, thy Yila may be found. Away, away, tempt me not by that, enchantress Hautia. I know thee not. I fear thee not, but instinct makes me hate thee. Away, my eyes are frozen shut. I will not be tempted more. How glorious it burns, cried Medea. I reel with incense. Can such sweets be evil? Look, look, cried Yumi, its petals wane and creep. One moment more, and the night flower shuts up forever the last, last hope of Yila. Yila, 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 bade three vengeful voices far behind. Yila, Yila, dash the urn. I follow, Hautia, though thy lure be death. The Sirius closed, and in a mist, the siren prow went on before, we following. When day dawned, three radiant pilot-fish swam in advance, three ravenous sharks astern. And full before us rose the Isle of Hautia. Chapter 87 They Draw Nigh to Flozella As if Marty were a poem and every island a canto, the shore now in sight was called Flozella Anina or the last verse of the song. According to Mohi, the origin of this term was traceable to the remotest antiquity. In the beginning, there were other beings in Mardi besides Mardians, winged beings of pure minds and cast in gentler molds who would fain have dwelt forever with mankind. But the hearts of the Mardians were bitter against them because of their superior goodness. Yet those beings returned love for malice and long entreated to virtue and charity. But in the end, all Marty rose up against them, and hunted them from isle to isle, till at last they rose from the woodlands like a flight of birds, 
and disappeared in the skies. Thereafter, abandoned of such sweet influences, the Mardians fell into all manner of sins and sufferings, becoming the erring things their descendants were now. Yet they knew not that their calamities were of their own bringing down, for deemed a victory the expulsion of the winged beings was celebrated in choruses throughout Mardi. And among other jubilations, so ran the legend, a pain was composed, corresponding in the number of its stanzas to the number of islands. And a band of youths, gaily apparelled, voyaged in gala canoes all round the lagoon, singing upon each isle one verse of their song. And Flozella being the last isle in their circuit, its queen commemorated the circumstance by new naming her realm. That queen had first incited Mardi to wage war against the beings with wings. She it was who had been foremost in every assault, and that queen was ancestor of Hautia, now ruling the isle. Approaching the dominions of one who so long had haunted me, conflicting emotions tore up my soul in tornadoes. Yet Hautia had held out some prospect of crowning my yearnings. But how connected were Hautia and Yila? Something I hoped, yet more I feared. Dire presentiments, like poisoned arrows, shot through me. Had they pierced me before, straight to Flozella would I have voyaged, not waiting for Hautia to woo me by that last and victorious temptation. But unchanged remained my feelings of hatred for Hautia, yet vague those feelings as the language of her flowers. Nevertheless, in some mysterious way seemed Hautia and Yila connected. But Yila was all beauty and innocence, my crown of felicity, my heaven below, and Hautia my whole heart aboard. Yila I sought, Hautia sought me. One openly beckoned me here, the other dimly allured me there. Yet now was I wildly dreaming to find them together. But so distracted my soul, I knew not what it was that I thought. Slowly we neared the land. Flozella Anina, an omen? Was this isle then to prove the last place of my search, even as it was the last verse of the song? End of section 18 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 19 of Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2, by Herman Melville. Chapters 88 through 91. Chapter 88. They Land. A jewel tiara nodding in spray looks flowery flozella approach from the sea. For lo, you, the glittering foam all round its white marge, where forcing themselves underneath the coral ledge, and up through its crevices in fountains the blue billows gush, while within, zone above zone, thrice zoned in belts of bloom, all the isle as a hanging garden soars, its tapering cone blending aloft with heaven's own blue. What flies through the spray? What incense is this? cried Medea. Ha! you wild breeze, you have been plundering the gardens of Hautia, cried Yumi. No sweets can be sweeter, said Braidbeard, but no upas more deadly. Anon we came nearer, sails idly flapping and paddles suspended. Sleek currents our coursers, and round about the isle, like winged rainbows, shoals of dolphins were leaping over floating fragments of wrecks, dark green, long-haired ribs, and keels of canoes. For many shallops inveigled by the eddies were oft dashed to pieces against that flowery strand. But what cared the dolphins? Mardian wrecks were their homes. Over and over they sprang, from east to west, rising and setting, many suns in a moment, while all the sea, like a harvest plain, was stacked with their glittering sheaves of spray. And far down, fathoms on fathoms, flitted rainbow hues, as sains full of mermaids, 
half screening the bones of the drowned. Swifter and swifter the currents now ran, till with a shock our prows were beached. There, beneath an arch of spray, three dark-eyed maidens stood, garlanded with columbines, their nectaries nodding like jester's bells, and robed in vestments blue. The pilot-fish transformed, cried Yumi. The night-eyed heralds three, said Mohi. Following the maidens, we now took our way along a winding vale, where, by sweet-scented hedges, flowed blue-braided brooks, their tributaries rivulets of violets, meandering through the meads. On one hand forever glowed the rosy mountains with a tropic dawn, and on the other lay an arctic eve. The white daisies drifted in long banks of snow, and snowed the blossoms from the orange boughs. There summer breathed her bridal bloom, her hilltop temples crowned with bridal wreaths. We wandered on through orchards arched in long arcades that seemed baronial halls hung o'er with trophies. So spread the boughs and antlers. This orchard was the frontlet of the isle. The fruit hung high in air that only beaks, not hands, might pluck. Here the peach tree showed her thousand cheeks of down kissed often by the wooing winds. Here in swarms the yellow apples hived like golden bees upon the boughs. Here from the kneeling fainting trees thick fell the cherries in great drops of blood. And here the pomegranate, with cold rind and sear, deep pierced by bills of birds, revealed the mellow of its ruddy core. So, off the heart, that cold and withered seems, within yet hides its juices. This orchard passed, the vale became a lengthening plain, that seemed the straits of Ormus, bared so thick it lay with flowery gems. Turquoise, hyacinths, ruby roses, lily pearls. Here roved the vagrant vines, their flaxen ringlets curling over arbors, which laughed and shook their golden locks. From bower to bower flew the wee bird that ever hovering seldom lights, and flights of gay canaries passed, like jonquils winged. But now, from out half-hidden bowers of clematis, there issued swarms of wasps, which flying wide settled on all the buds. And... Fifty nymphs preceding, who now follows from those bowers with gliding, artful steps, the very snares of love, Hautia, a gorgeous amaryllis in her hand, Circe flowers in her ears, her girdle tied with vervain. She came by private hedges, drooping, downcast honeysuckles. She trod on pinks and pansies, bluebells, heath, and lilies. She glided on her crescent brow calm as the moon, when most it works its evil influences. Her eye was fathomless, but the same mysterious evil boding gaze was there, which long before had haunted me in Odo, ere Yila fled. Queen Hatia, the incognito. Then two wild currents met, and dashed me into foam. Yila, Yila, tell me, queen. But she stood motionless radiant and scentless, a dahlia on its stalk. Where? Where? Is not thy voyage now ended? Take flowers. Damsels, give him wine to drink. After his weary hunt, be the wanderer happy. I dashed aside their cups and flowers, still rang the veil with Yila. Taji, did I know her fate, naught would I now disclose. My heralds pledge their queen to naught. Thou but comest here to supplant thy mourner's nightshade with marriage roses. Damsels, give him wreaths. Crowd round him. Press him with your cups. Once more I spilled their wine and tore their garlands. Is not that the evil eye that long ago did haunt me? And thou, the hautia who hast followed me, and wooed, and mocked, and tempted me, through all this long, long voyage. I swear, thou knowest all. I am Hatia. Thou hast come at last. Crown him with your flowers. Drown him in your wine. To all questions, Taji, I am mute. Away! Damsels, dance! Reel round him, round and round. 
Then their feet made music on the rippling grass, like thousand leaves of lilies on a lake. And, gliding nearer, Hatia welcomed Medea, and said, Your comrade here is sad. Be ye gay. Ho, wine, I pledge ye, guests. Then, marking all, I thought to seem what I was not, that I might learn at last the thing I sought. So, three cups in hand I held, drank wine and laughed, and halfway met Queen Hatia's blandishments. Chapter 89 They Enter the Bower of Hatia Conducted to the arbor from which the queen had emerged, we came to a sweet briar bower within, and reclined upon odorous mats. Then, in citron cups, sherbet of tamarinds was offered to Medea, Mohi, Yumi. To me, a nautilus shell, brimmed with a light-like fluid, that welled and welled like a fount. Quaff, Taji, quaff! Every drop drowns a thought. Like a blood freshet, it ran through my veins. A filter? How Hatia burned before me, glorious queen! with all the radiance lighting up the equatorial night. Thou art most magical, O queen. About thee a thousand constellations cluster. They blaze to burn, whispered Mohi. I see ten million Hatias. All space reflects her as a mirror. Then, in reels, the damsels once more mazed, the blossoms shaking from their brows, till Hatia glided near. Arms lustrous as rainbows, chanting some wild invocation. My soul ebbed out. Yila, there was none. But as I turned round opened armed, Hatia vanished. She is deeper than the sea, said Medea. Her bow is bent, said Yumi. I could tell wonders of Hatia and her damsels, said Mohi. What wonders? Listen and in his own words will I recount the adventure of the youth Ozona. It will show thee, Taji, that the maidens of Hatia are all Yilas held captive, unknown to themselves, and that Hatia, their enchantress, is the most treacherous of queens. Camel-like laden with woe, said Ozona, after many wild rovings in quest of a maiden long lost, beautiful Addy, and after being repelled in Marama and in vain hailed to land at Serenia, represented as naught but another Marama, with vague promises of discovering Addy, three sirens who long had pursued, at last inveigled me to Flocella, where Hatia made me her thrall. But ere long in Rhea, one of her maidens, I thought I discovered my Addy transformed. My arms opened wide to embrace, but the damsel knew not Ozona, and even when after hard wooing I won her again, she seemed not lost Eddie, but Rhea. Yet all the while, from deep in her strange black orbs, Eddie's blue eyes seemed pensively looking. Blue eye within black, sad, silent soul within Mary. Long I strove by fixed, ardent gazing to break the spell and restore in Rhea my lost one's past. But in vain. It was only Rhea, not Addy, who at stolen intervals looked on me now. One morning Hatia started as she greeted me. Her quick eye rested on my bosom. And glancing there, affrighted, I beheld a distinct, fresh mark, the impress of Rhea's necklace drop. Fleeing, I revealed what had passed to the maiden, who broke from my side, as I from Hatia's. The queen summoned her damsels, but for many hours the call was unheeded. And when at last they came, upon each bosom lay a necklace drop like Rhea's. On the morrow, lo, my arbor was strown over with bruised linden leaves, exuding a vernal juice. Full of forebodings, again I sought Rhea, who, casting down her eyes, beheld her feet stained green. Again she fled, and again Hatia summoned her damsels, malicious triumph in her eye but dismay succeeded. Each maid had spotted feet. That night Rhea was torn from my side by three masks, who, stifling her cries, rapidly bore her away, and as I pursued, disappeared in a cave. Next morning, Hatia was surrounded by her nymphs, but Rhea was absent. 
Then, gliding near, she snatched from my hair a jet-black tress, loose-hanging. Ozona is the murderer. See, Rhea's torn hair entangled with his. Aghast, I swore that I knew not her fate. Then let the witch Larfi be called. The maidens darted from the bower, and soon after there rolled into it a green coconut, followed by the witch, and all the damsels flinging anemones upon it. Bowling this way and that, the nut at last rolled to my feet. It is he, cried all. Then they bound me with osiers, and at midnight, unseen and irresistible hands placed me in a shallop, which sped far out into the lagoon, where they tossed me to the waves. But so violent the shock, the osiers burst. And as the shallop fled one way, swimming another, ere long I gained land. Thus, in Flozella, I found but the phantom of Addy, and slew the last hope of Addy the true. This recital sank deep into my soul. In some wild way, Hatia had made a captive of Yila. In some one of her black-eyed maids, the blue-eyed one was transformed. From side to side in frenzy I turned, but in all those cold, mystical eyes saw not the warm ray that I sought. Hast taken root within this treacherous soil, cried Medea. Away, thy Yila is behind thee, not before. Deep she dwells in blue Serenia's groves, which thou wouldst not search. Hautia mocks thee. Away, the reef is rounded, but a strait flows between this isle and Odo, and thither its ruler must return. Every hour I tarry here, some wretched serf is dying there, for whom, from blessed Serenia, I carry life and joy. Away! Art still bent on finding evil for thy good? cried Mohi. How can Yila harbor here? Beware, let not Hatia so enthrall thee. Come away, come away, cried Yumi. Far hence is Yila, and he who tarries among these flowers must needs burn juniper. Look on me, Medea, Mohi, Yumi. Here I stand, my own monument, till Hatia breaks the spell. In grief they left me. Vivi's conch I heard no more. Chapter 90 Taji with Hatia As their last echoes died away down the valley, Hatia glided near. Zone unbound, the amaryllis in her hand. Her bosom ebbed and flowed, the motes danced in the beams that darted from her eyes. Come, let us sin and be merry. Ho, wine, 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 and lapfuls of flowers. Let all the cane breaks pipe their flutes. Damsels, dance, reel, swim, around me. I, the vortex that draws all in. Taji, Taji, as a berry that name is juicy in my mouth. Taji, Taji, and in choruses she warbled forth the sound till it seemed issuing from her siren eyes. My heart flew forth from out its bars and soared in air, but as my hand touched Hatia's, down dropped a dead bird from the clouds. Ha! How he sinks! But didst ever dive in deep waters, Taji? Didst ever see where pearls grow? To the cave! Damsels, lead on! Then, wending through constellations of flowers, we entered deep groves, and thus, thrice from sunlight to shade, it seemed three brief nights and days ere we paused before the mouth of the cavern. A bow shot from the sea, it pierced the hillside like a vaulted way, and glancing in we saw far gleams of water, crossed here and there by long-flung distant shadows of domes and columns. All Venice seemed within. From a stack of golden palm stalks, the damsels now made torches. Then stood grouped, a sheaf of sirens in a sheaf of frame. Illuminated, the cavern shone like a queen of candy's casket, full of dawns and sunsets. From rocky roof to bubbling floor, it was columned with stalactites, and galleried all round in spiral tiers with sparkling coral ledges. And now their torches held aloft, into the water the maidens softly glided, and each a lotus floated, while from far above, into the air Hatia flung her flambeau. 
then bounding after in the lake two meteors were quenched where she dived the flambeau clustered and up among them hautia rose hands full of pearls lo taji all these may be had for the diving and beauty health wealth long life and the last lost hope of man but through me alone may these be had dive thou and bring up one pearl if thou canst down 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 in the clear sparkling water till i seemed crystallized in the flashing heart of a diamond but from those bottomless depths i uprose empty-handed pearls pearls thy pearls thou art fresh from the mines ah taji for thee bootless deep diving yet to hautia one shallow plunge reveals many golcondas but come dive with me join hands let me show thee strange things show me that which i seek and i will dive with thee straight through the world till we come up in oceans unknown nay nay but join hands and i will take thee where thy past shall be forgotten where thou wilt soon learn to love the living not the dead better to me o hautia all the bitterness of my buried dead than all the sweets of the life thou canst bestow even were it eternal chapter ninety one marty behind an ocean before returned from the cave hautia reclined in her clematis bower invisible hands flinging fennel around her and nearer and nearer stole dulcet sounds dissolving my woes as warm beams snow strange languors made me droop once more within my inmost vault side by side the past and yila lay two bodies tranced while like a rounding sun before me haughty a magnified magnificence and through her fixed eyes slowly drank up my soul thus we stood snake and victim life ebbing out from me to her but from that spell i burst again as all the past smote all the present in me o hautia thou knowest the mystery i die to fathom i see it crouching in thine eye reveal weal or woe life or death see see and yila's rose pearl danced before me i snatched it from her hand yila yila rave on she lies too deep to answer stranger voices than thine she hears bubbles are bursting round her drowned drowned then even as she dreamed i come i come ha what form is this hast mosses sea thyme pearls help help i sink back shining monster what hautia is it thou o vipress i could slay thee go go and slay thyself i may not make thee mine go dead to dead there is another cavern in the hill swift i fled along the valley side past hautia's cave of pearls and gained a twilight arch within a lake transparent shone conflicting currents met and wrestled and one dark arch led to channels seaward tending round and round a gleaming form slow circled in the deepest eddies white and vaguely yila straight i plunged but the currents were as fierce headwinds off capes that beat back ships then as i frenzied gazed gaining the one dark arch the revolving shade darted out of sight and the eddies whirled as before stay stay let me go with thee though thou glidest to gulfs of blackness naught can exceed the hell of this despair why beat longer in this corpse o oh, my heart as somnambulists fast frozen in some horrid dream ghost-like glide abroad and fright the wakeful world so that night with death-glazed eyes to and fro i flitted on the damp and weedy beach is this spectre taji and mohi and the minstrel stood before me taji lives no more so dead he has no ghost i am his spirit's phantom's phantom nay then phantom 
The time has come to flee. They dragged me to the water's brink, where a prow was beached. Soon, Mohi at the helm, we shot beneath the far-flung shadow of a cliff, when, as in a dream, I hearkened to a voice. Arrived at Odo, Medea had been met with yells. Sedition was in arms, and to his beard defied him. Vain all concessions, then. Foremost stood the three pale sons of him whom I had slain to gain the maiden lost. Avengers from the first hour we had parted on the sea, they had drifted on my track, survived starvation, and lived to hunt me round all Mardi's reef, and now at Odo, that last threshold, waited to destroy, or there, missing the revenge they sought, still swore to hunt me round eternity. Behind the Avengers raged a stormy mob, invoking Medea to renounce his rule. But one hand waving like a pennant above the smoke of some sea fight, straight through that tumult Medea sailed serene, the rioters parting from before him as wild waves before a prow inflexible. A haven gained, he turned to Mohi and the minstrel. O oh, friends, after our long companionship, hard to part. But henceforth, for many moons, Odo will prove no home for old age or youth. In Serenia only will ye find the peace ye seek, and thither ye must carry Taji, who else must soon be slain or lost. Go, release him from the thrall of Hautia, outfly the Avengers and gain Serenia. Reek not of me. The state is tossed in storms, and where I stand the combing billows must break over. But among all noble souls in tempest time the headmost man last flies the wreck, so here in Odo will I abide, though every plank breaks up beneath me. And then, great Odo, let the king die clinging to the keel. Farewell. Such Mohi's Tale In trumpet blasts the hoarse night winds now blew, the lagoon black with the still shadows of the mountains and the driving shadows of the clouds. Of all the stars only red Arcturus shone, but through the gloom and on the circumvallating reef the breakers dashed ghost-white. An outlet in that outer barrier was nigh. Ah, Yila, Yila, the currents sweep thee oceanward. Nor will I tarry behind. Marty, farewell. Give me the helm, old man. Nay, madman, Serenia is our haven. Through yonder strait for thee perdition lies and from the deep beyond no voyager e'er puts back. And why put back? Is a life of dying worth living o'er again? Let me, then, be the unreturning wanderer, the helm. By Oro, I will steer my own fate, old man. Marty, farewell. Nay, Taji, commit not the last, last crime, cried Yumi. He's seized the helm. Eternity is in his eye. Yumi, for our lives we must now swim. And plunging, they struck out for land, Yumi buoying Mohi up, and the salt waves dashing the tears from his pallid face, as through the scud he turned it on me mournfully. Now I am my own soul's emperor, and my first act is abdication. Hail, realm of shades! and turning my prow into the racing tide which seized me like a hand omnipotent, I darted through. Churned in foam, that outer ocean lashed the clouds, and straight in my white wake, headlong dashed a shallop, three fixed specters leaning o'er its prow, three arrows poising. And thus, pursuers and pursued, flew on, over an endless sea. End of section 19 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. End of Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume 2 by Herman Melville.